policy and regulation for electric vehicles. We will navigate the various tools and opportunities for uh, simulating demand and supply of immobility. And uh, our colleagues Stephanie and Peter will share with us instruments to mainstream immobility and afterwards, where we will illustrate us with the policies that we can see nowadays in Asia. Then we will have the intervention of a great panel of experts that we will show inspiring immobility implementation experiences for China, Korea, and Europe. And the case studies that uh, we represented today will focus on national and local immobility policies and the targets of these policies. Here you can uh, find the main questions we will be addressing today from a government's perspective, implementing immobility, uh, immobility sorry, requires a concerted effort with a right mix of policies. So incentives and regulations um, uh, um, important to know to which path uh, to follow. Having the right incentive and policies in place will generate the demand for immobility and the regulations will control the quantity and the quality of mobility implementation and scale up. Um, but before I would like to make a recap from the day one, and we got a great participation from 16 countries. And yesterday we heard from Philippines, Vietnam, Nepal, Nigeria, Singapore, and India, and they spoke about the mobility in avoid shift improve context about the immobility ecosystem and stakeholders and the e-vehicle market prices and strategies to reduce this and also reflected upon um, if COVID-19 has had an impact on the future mobility situation and in the Asian cities. Also, we got our leaf poll. You can see here the results, and it was really exciting to get to know that many cities have started the path toward a low carbon mobility with electric solutions. And um, so we can see that we are creating a, a great advance on that matter. Also, I would like to introduce uh, briefly our speakers. Uh, we have uh, Stephanie Holzbart, which is a sustainable urban mobility expert within the UN Habitat, also in the mobility team. And she's trained in urban planning and has been working on sustainable mobility projects for the last seven years, providing technical advice, knowledge, and advocacy to governments around the world. We also count with the presence of Siddharth Sina. It is aligned to the office of the CEO and the Transfer Vertical Admitted IO. And he is responsible for the overall coordination of the NDC and ITF DTE projects in, um, in Admiti and is part of the Edison Alliance of the World Economic Forum. Bert Fabian, let's, uh, he leads the work of UN uh, Environment Sustainable Mobility Unit in Asia Pacific and coordinates the activities of the Global uh, for Economy Initiative and the initiative that aims to double the efficiency of the global light duty vehicle fleet by 2015, the electric wheelers project in East Africa and Southeast Asia. Liu Qiang, which is a transport engineer at Institute of Transport and Development Policy, specializing in a transport demand modeling, public policy, logistics, and supply chain management and data analytics. analytics. Mr. Li uh, is the CEO of Eval Company located in South Korea and currently the electric vehicle safety training and EV service solutions provider. And uh, we also great uh, to count with his great experience today to show us on some of the case studies. And um, finally, we have Aida Abdullah, which is a senior project manager in UTP Knowledge and Innovation. It's a master in, bio in environment sciences and with more than 10 years of project management experience in sustainability of mobility. So before I give the, the stage to my colleague, Stephanie, I would like to do some areas engagement. We will be sharing um, the screen. So in a minute. So please kindly open a browser or if you have a phone and then go to slido.com and uh, you can, um, enter this code and be part of the poll. We would um, 
really much appreciated if we can know who is in the room. So which group of discipline are you representing? Out of the options we have here now. Well, that's great. We are counting with the uh, participations of every, many entities, especially private sector and academia, which is uh, really inspiring that we will see in the coming years and, and now the work towards um, shifting to e-mobility. Also, we have local government, NGOs, transport, also authority operators. So that is great because, yeah, we will be learning um, the many policies that we can together within private sector, NGOs, different stakeholders to really mainstream uh, the e-mobility and uh, how we can leverage the use of uh, uh, low carbon vehicles. Okay, that's great. Hello also from my side. My name is Stephanie and I'm part of the urban mobility team at UN Habitat. Um, it's great to see so many participants and it's also great to see the diversity of the participants. Um, today we're going to talk about um, policies and regulations and I think um, each and every um, a type of stakeholder, let's say, is important in some way or another in uh, developing uh, the right policy mix and also um, bringing forward um, adequate regulations that foster the uptake of electric mobility. So I'll be giving a bit of an introduction on electric vehicle policies and regulations on a very generic uh, level. I would like to start, off, start us off uh, by asking what challenges can policy makers actually tackle with e-mobility? And in a way, it is very important to first identify the challenges that can be addressed through electric mobility and also set strategic goals in order to develop um, the right policies. For example, in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it is important to increase the share of renewable energy sources in order to ensure electric vehicles run on green electricity. Another example would be in order to reduce congestion and improve accessibility, one-to-one -one replacement of vehicles will not be sufficient. Thus, we would be requiring other complement complementary mobility measures, such as introducing higher capacity modes in combination with electric mobility. Now, these examples illustrate that it is important to reflect on the intended outcomes um, and, and specific policy targets when we are reflecting and developing uh, on the policies uh, that we would like to implement to foster the uptake of electric mobility. Uh, one of the solutions partners, uh, Ruprecht Consult, actually carried out a campaign program in Europe, which was called the Elliptic Factor 100 campaign. Um, and the campaign was very interested, interesting because it reflected on the question why it is so important to focus on the electrification of public transport. And uh, Ruprecht actually did uh, the, the one by one comparison between cars and an 18 meter bus. And as you can see on the slide, a car is being driven for less than one hour a day while a bus uh, is in operations from 12 to 16 hours a day. And also uh, because of the tonnage, the annual fuel consumption of buses is obviously much higher than for cars and therefore also the emissions. Hence, and, and therefore the conclusion that you can draw from this slide is that you can, that if you incentivize the uptake of electric buses, you can get savings that are equivalent to 100 electric cars. So again, the question here is, what kind of e-mobility policy do we want to implement? And what is it that we want to incentivize by bringing forward um, regulations? So let's have a quick look at how e-mobility can steer changes in travel behavior and contribute to more efficient use of resources. Um, e-mobility has the potential 
to enhance multi multimodality and the resilience of the mobility network. Um, it also gives us the chance um, to give priority to more sustainable modes. Um, it also provides us with an alternative and new mobility services that are more effectively addressing uh, the user's needs. And it can also help us to improve the cost effectiveness of new mobility solutions by exploiting synergies and service integration. On this slide, you can see this idea of multimodality being illustrated. Um, electric mobility can really be a means to provide multimodal and door-to-door -door alternatives for users to avoid being dependent uh, too much on, on, on the private cars. And therefore, electric mobility can really enable a shift away from the cars to multimodality and more sustainable transport alternatives. We should therefore develop our policies with these opportunities in mind to fully exploit the potential of electric mobility. Looking at the policy instruments to, to mainstream electric mobility, we wanted to illustrate a few examples. Um, what is important to note is that the right uh, policies need to be developed and adopted at national and local levels, supporting the electrification of vehicles as and as mentioned, preferably with a focus of uh, public and shared vehicle fleets, which are the most cost-effective options among the electrification strategies. Now, ensuring that the deployment of electric vehicles and infrastructure fits within a sustainable urban mobility paradigm is very crucial to achieve the full benefits of this transition. From this graph, you can see that policies and strategies can on the one side generate um, higher demand for electric mobility, but on the other side, they can also stimulate the supply of e-mobility solutions. And you will also see that they can be implemented on a national or a local level. Starting with the national level, national authorities have a crucial role, role to play by setting the targets for the penetration of electric vehicles, uh, subsidy schemes, and other legal and financial incentives as well as also procurement programs to kickstart the demand and stimulate uh, the industry to increase the availability of electric vehicles on the market. In addition, a combination of fuel pricing and removal of fossil fuel subsidies, as well as differentiated vehicle and emission taxations can really help to boost energy efficiency in the transport sector and steer the purchase and deployment of electric vehicles. On the local level, it is very important uh, to strengthen the planning capacity um, of the governments for sustainable urban mobility planning and uh, making sure that electric mobility is well reflected in sustainable urban mobility plans with targets um, and, and uh, measurable indicators. There's a nice guidance uh, developed by one of the Solutions Plus partners, uh, Ruprecht, um, that developed uh, kind of some uh, guidelines and topic guides where, where one of them is on electrification. On the local level, it's also important to look at land use plans, making sure that um, we're, we're, we are also working on, on compactness and on mixed, mixed land uses, which can also facilitate higher uptake of, of electric mobility. And uh, lastly, it's also very important to work with private developers ensuring that e-mobility considerations are made in any new housing and building uh, developments that are taking place in cities. On the fiscal side, um, it's important to look at uh, financial incentives for e-mobility that could, for example, be lower parking fees uh, for people that, that are parking electric vehicles. There can also be incentives uh, for model integration, for example, through smart ticketing of um, electric uh, micromobility options, for example, in, um, in integration with uh, the public transport systems of cities. But there's also opportunities around uh, public procurement for e-mobility uptake, for example, as part, of, as part of municipal vehicle fleets. If you look at institutional and regulatory um, issues, there is a lot of opportunities around vehicle access to central areas and cities and low emission zones. As mentioned before, there's also a lot of opportunities around parking management and ensuring that the fees that are collected from parking, for example, can be reinvested um, in sustainable mobility modes. And there are 
for the um, opportunities and for the potential uh, around parking statues and the requirements for charging infrastructure for um, electric vehicles. One uh, example that uh, should also be um, should also be implemented um, and considered more in, in on a city level context are transit hubs where cities should be supported in the creation of those intermodal transit hubs that enable the seamless connectivity between the mass transit and possibly electric feeder services and any uh, charging facilities should be made um, against the, the principle of interoperability to make sure that different modes can utilize uh, the same pieces of infrastructure for cost, cost effectiveness of uh, the charging infrastructures. In terms of the charging infrastructure development, um, it's important um, that we are adopting uh, charging standards. And as mentioned before, the interoperability is a very important aspect here. We should also look at impetuses for an initial rollout of a publicly accessible charging infrastructure that would really facilitate a, a faster and ac accelerated uptake of immobility. mobility And um, we should look at the deployment of publicly accessible chargers in cities and along highway networks um, that would help us also to work on the, on the range anxiety that is often a barrier for electric mobility uptake. Uh, lastly, uh, it's important to mention that uh, communication should not be forgotten when we're looking at um, developing policy and regulations. It's very important to involve the stakeholders and, and especially the citizens in early stages of, of the discussions of e-mobility deployment. Um, that could, for example, be done by awareness raising um, when we, for example, imp implement uh, low emission zones. Uh, we, could, we could test them in temporary uh, events such as car free days and, and, and have a discussions with the citizens and the, and the neighborhoods and the residents in the neighborhoods on the benefits of having those low emission zones, the benefits of electric mobility and so on. So engaging the citizens and also, uh, let's say, the, the innovators in cities is, is very important uh, for a quick uptake. Having said all this, uh, and knowing that there is so many policy and regulatory measures uh, that are available to us, I think an important question is, is uh, to ask why are we not there yet? And it's obviously not as easy to implement certain uh, policies and regulatory frameworks. We recently did an, an analysis of an overview of the key barriers that are yet hindering the de development of electric mobility. And if you look at um, the side of uh, policy, regulatory and institutional frameworks, we still find a lot of um, barriers, for example, around um, the coordination and, and the common vision with, within public institutions and external players. We still see that often there is a lack of restrictions on fossil fuel vehicles. And without those restrictions, it's, it's, a, it's um, more complicated to, to implement and accelerate the mobility. We also do lack data on air pollution which would always be a good evidence base to foster the uptake of immobility. But if you don't know the levels, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to make an evidence uh, case for, for implementing an immobility policy. And we also see that there is still a lot of conflict over space allocation and space use between conventional uh, cars and more sustainable modes. With that, I would like to end my presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. So my, my name is Siddharth Sinha. I represent uh, Niti Aayog of the Government of India. So Niti, Niti Aayog is the national institution for uh, transforming India. It's essentially India's uh, highest uh, policy-making agency. And we also serve as an official think tank of the government. And we were specifically tasked to catalyze you know, economic development in the country and, you know, bring together different ministries uh, towards the common goal of economic development, urban development, and so on and so forth. So we work with a range of different ministries, and we are headed by uh, the Prime Minister of India. Um, uh, just before I jump into the whole electric vehicles thing, I just, I just wanted to, you know, kind of bring to your attention why, uh, you know, this has become such an important issue in India, because the transport sector contributes about 14% of total emissions, you know, in India, and this has more than tripled since, you know, 1990, if you see, uh, you know, if you see the graph on your right, what it shows you is that between 2005 and 2015, the emissions have doubled, but if you look at this figure, you know, from 1990 onwards, this is actually sort of uh, you know, tripled, and we're expecting that you know in the next 
10 years, our total vehicle sales are actually going to go up to about, you know, 200 odd million. And what's really interesting is where EVs come into the picture is the fact that in India, roads carry 90% of, you know, of the modal share. So the average of freight and passengers would be about 90%. And out of these 14% contributions that come from the transport sector, 90% of them actually come from the road sector. And as is the case globally, India is witnessing rapid urbanization. Uh, you know, UN uh, data estimates say that, you know, Delhi might end up becoming one of the most populous cities. So what we also see is an urban sprawl. So, you know, the number of vehicles also increase. And given that road sector is such a big contributor, there's of course a need uh, to, you know, take measures towards uh, uh, you know, decarbonization. And of course, the, the, the recent uh, example, which everybody would be able to relate to, or the recent development rather, is COVID-19, because what it has done is that it has made people kind of shift away uh, from public transport, uh, you know, towards private modes of transport, which is, I mean, it's, it's a worrying trend, but it also brings, uh, you know, an opportunity. Uh, but, you know, just to say that electric vehicles are, of course, a very important part of, you know, of, of you know, ushering mobility, which is sort of clean and, you know, uh, you know, connected. But the government of India has also taken a number of other measures across sectors, because EV is one part of, you know, your ability to decarbonize transport sector. Uh, so, you know, we've come up with a vehicle strapping policy. We've come up with 11 committees to, you know, drive circular economy in various areas. Uh, we've come, uh, you know, we've, we have the FAME policy, which is specific to electric vehicles, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, you know, we have the national urban transport policy, which actually, you know, talks about creating a, which also talks about creating a, you know, unified metropolitan transport agency. And which is really important is because as Steffi was saying that we also need to talk about, you know, compact cities, urban sprawl, you know, mixed land use. And all of this is only possible when you're able to bring together different agencies, whether they're municipal or transport together. And, you know, that's why this policy is important. So, of course, uh, these are a lot of different initiatives, but I think, you uh, I would use this to actually talk about the EV ecosystem in India. So what we see over here is that between 1981 and 2011, uh, there was a 77% increase in the population of India. But if you look at uh, the increase in the number of motor vehicles, uh, you know, they grew by almost 2,500%, which is, which is a huge number, right? Um, and so what we're trying to say now is that because this growth is so phenomenal, but despite this growth, if we look at the number of cars per million population, what we actually see is that while the US would have about 837 cars per 1,000 people, uh, you know, uh, in India, this is just about 22 cars per 1,000 population. And that's kind of interesting because, you know, then you actually have a huge opportunity to replace whatever addition is going to happen in the number of vehicles by, you know, mobility, which is kind of clean. And that's where electric vehicles sort of, uh, you know, sort of really come into, uh, you know, sort of really come into the picture. Uh, then what we see is, uh, if you look at the graph in yellow, this talks about the two-wheeler sales. Uh, and as you can see, they've, they've been constantly growing. So electric two-wheelers, by the way, the most popular forms of electric mobility in India, and we are seeing a constant upward growth. And in fact, it is projected by 2030, you might see about 24 million, uh, you know, registered, uh, you know, electric two wheelers uh, on, on, on the roads. And the kind of phenomenal growth that we are witnessing is that between 2015 and 2020, if you look at the uptake of electric mobility, and we are, uh, we are talking about the overall EV sales, which also includes four wheelers, two wheelers, we, we've seen, you know, a CAGR of 133%. Uh, and you know that's that's really interesting. Now, what has what has really led to this is where our policy instruments come, uh, you know, into the picture. So we have something known as uh, you know the Fame policy. So the Fame policy stands for the faster adoption and manufacturing of electric and uh, you know hybrid vehicles, right? So Fame two policy, there were two versions of this. This is the second version. It actually supports electrification of public and shared transportation. And it aims to subsidize about 7,000 electric buses, about 500,000 electric three-wheelers, about 55,000 four-wheelers, uh, you know, about a million two-wheelers and about 4,000, you know, charging stations, right? And this is the subsidy that actually gets passed on this is actually the subsidy which is provided to the original equipment manufacturers. And that's important because 
they sort of then pass it on, uh, you know, to the end user or the consumer or the buyers of these electric vehicles. Uh, and if you look at what has been what has been availed out of the subsidies that we are actually providing to the manufacturers, about you know the subsidy has already been availed out of the seven thousand available for e-buses for about six thousand two hundred sixty-five. Uh, about 15,000 three wheelers, uh, 15, 40 four wheelers. That's really interesting. You know, if we look at the four wheelers there, we see that it's available for 55,000, but it's available, it's been availed only for 1,540. And, and the reason for this is that this has been made available, uh, you know, only for uh, the four wheelers, which are going to be used in shared mobility or, you know, uh, uh, and, and I think that's what's not allowing private car manufacturers to avail this. So this is something that's being considered. Uh, and this will feed back into the probably the next time the policy is revised. Uh, and similarly, about 57,000 electric two wheelers have also availed this. So, so PAM has two components. One, of course, is the subsidy component, and the other is something which is known as the phased manufacturing program. Now, what's also important for India as a country is to start manufacturing components which are used for electric vehicles. And so what we did was that we introduced something known as the phased manufacturing program where we've actually incentivized the manufacture of low value EV accessories by increasing the basic customs duty on these smaller components, which are actually being imported. So in that way, it gives a greater incentive for, you know, more number of local manufacturers to actually start uh, manufacturing them. And over time, we aim to, you know, go from the production of these low cost components to high cost components, and that is happening through something known as the production linked incentive schemes, which the government has recently launched. And I will come to that in just a second. But before that, what are the other policy instruments that other ministries have, have deployed, right? So we have the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. What they've done is they've, and since we are a federal structure, we cannot, as the central government, we cannot force the state governments to do something. But what we can do is to, you know, issue advisories to them. And what we've told them is that you should really exempt, uh, you know, the road tax on electric vehicles. You should exempt battery operated vehicles from, you know, paying the registration fees in that particular state. Uh, uh, we have actually come up with a notification on sale of vehicles without batteries. So that's, that's a new notification which has been launched so that, the consumer can actually understand that what differential in cost is actually being brought about by the battery itself, because we also want to give, a, you know, kind of an impetus to the battery swapping industry in India. So we've actually now, we actually now have a notification where it's not mandatory for a consumer to actually purchase an electric vehicle with a battery. They can actually produce, uh, uh, sorry, procure a battery, uh, you know, separately. Uh, we've also looked at, uh, MORF has also come up with the deregistration and scrapping of government old vehicles, which are old. And we are also considering the imposition of a green tax where vehicles older than eight years might be asked, uh, you know, to pay a green tax. Then if you look at the measures which have been brought about by the Ministry of Finance, the goods and services tax, uh, which consumers are liable to pay. On electric vehicles, this rate was originally 12%, but in order to sort of boost the uptake, this was brought down from 12% uh, to 5%. Uh, the same tax on the EV chargers, which was earlier at 18%, was then brought down to 5%. Uh, then you were also given tax deductions on the interest paid on loans to purchase electric vehicles up to USD 1500. And if you are a private company or a government agency which is hiring electric buses for the transport of your employees or whosoever it might be, uh, you are now exempt from, you know, from paying tax on that. Uh, if you look at the Housing and Urban Affairs Ministry and city planning, of course, is an integral concept. I have not touched upon it much. I, I, in fact, I haven't touched upon it in my presentation, but that, of course, is very integral to ushering any kind of uh, you know, mobility that we might have. So what we see is the amendments to the model building bylaws, which have been brought about by Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Now it's for states and urban local bodies to kind of, uh, you know, notify them and why these bylaws, why these changes have been brought so that there is provision in office buildings, in commercial buildings, in residential buildings to allow for installation of, you know, electric vehicle chargers by default. So, for example, our bylaws would state something like, okay, if your house is four floors and if you to make that house, you, man, you need to have a parking that's built. Similarly, now the bylaws actually say that you need to have provisions for, uh, you know, charging points for electric vehicles. 
But similarly, Ministry of Power has, you know, issued a number of notifications. Uh, they've actually defined what these electric vehicle components are, uh, you know, uh, so that there's a level playing field between EV manufacturers and manufacturers of, uh, you know, you know, uh, manufacture, other manufacturers, right? Uh, because earlier, before this whole EV concept came in, there was not a very clear definition. What exactly is an EV charger? What exactly is charging infrastructure? So I think that definition was very important so that you provide a level playing field for the people who are actually, or the companies rather, who are actually, uh, you know, sort of manufacturing these. Um, and the Ministry of Environment, in fact, has drafted a notification on bas battery waste management which is very important from a, for, for an urban mining perspective, because as your EVs go up, the you know, demand for batteries would also go up. So there is a certain value extraction that you have to do from the batteries, which also you know, brings down, for, ultimately would bring down production costs and also uh, does away with the resource scarcity that we have in terms of you know, lithium and cobalt. Uh, in terms of what our role is as the National Institution for Transforming India, uh, or NITIO, which is the uh, ministry that I represent over here, so we at Niti IO, we realized that because there are so many different ministries, and this would be a problem that uh, you know the, the the participants of various other countries also might be facing, is that there there's a lot of different agencies, you know. So the charging infrastructure for us, it's Ministry of Power which is looking at it. If it's manufacturing of batteries or vehicles, it's Department of Heavy Industries. If it's bylaws, it's Housing and Urban Agents, you know, Urban Development Ministry. So I think somewhere there was a need that there should be one agency which should bring together and galvanize the efforts of all, all of these different stakeholders. And that's where we created the National Mission on Transformative Mobility and Battery Storage. And we have actually been working with different states to actually help them come up with their EV policies. So by the way, India does not have a central EV policy, but it's actually the state governments which are you know coming up with their own EV policies. And as Niti IO, we've actually been helping them come up and draft these state policies. And so far, 22 governments have already, you know, come up with, 22 state governments have already come up with their policies. Uh, we help the states and union and our territories, you know, undertake capacity building exercises. We have frequent interactions with them. You know, we bring in, uh, you know, best practices. We, we are working on model concessionaire agreements for deployment of electric buses to an operating expense model, uh, you know, uh, we got the charging standards notified, uh, you know, we're running campaigns to encourage e-mobility uptake. And now we have actually formed 11 different committees to look at circular economy across a number of areas. And one of them, of course, is the recycling of batteries. And that, of course, is very important, uh, you know, for the, uh, for the kind of EV uptake in India that is required. What we also have on uh, the, so what we've done so far, or what I was talking about so far, are measures which are related to the demand side of things. But it's also important to look at, you know, the supply side of things. So India very recently launched a production linked incentive schemes, I believe across, uh, you know, 17 or 18 different sectors, whether it's telecom, pharmaceutical, automobiles, solar energy. The idea was that we want to bring in more manufacturers into the country and we want to encourage them to set up manufacturing units across area. And so we came up with something very unique. We said that we will have something known as the production linked incentive scheme, where whatever you produce, and if you meet certain production targets, you will actually be given a monetary incentive to actually produce those number of units or that class of units. So what we have, uh, which pertains directly to EV is the PLI scheme for ACC battery storage, which is the advanced cell chemistry battery storage. And this scheme has a total outlay of about 2.5 billion USD. And what we want is that, you know, through a competitive bidding process, we will uh, actually select manufacturers who would then be required to set up uh, a minimum of, you know, five gigawatt hour capacity, uh, you know, uh, battery manufacturing units and ensure that there is at least a 60% value addition uh, within five years, uh, you know, from setting up your manufacturing units. And this kind of incentive will be paid out, you know, on the basis of your sales, energy efficiency, battery life cycle, and, you know, there's a number of other parameters which are there uh, in, in, in the bidding process and the scheme guidelines. And we expect that as a result of this, about 5.9 billion USD worth of direct investment is going to come in and it's also going to save us about 33 billion USD in terms of, you know, uh, reduction of, uh, you know, oil import bill. 
similarly the other production linked incentive scheme which was just launched a couple of months ago and which has uh, which has uh, an outlay of 3.5 billion usd uh, is the scheme to incentivize uh, electric vehicle and fuel cell ev manufacturing or the auto and automobile components so what we've done as a result of this we've covered charging ports drive trains you know electric vacuum pumps compressors flex fuel kits hydrogen cell fuel kits uh and ice engine vehicles of course uh, you know some parts but at least 90% of this subsidy is specifically encouraging uh the production of electric vehicles in the country which is which is uh, you know which is really interesting uh what we also launched uh is uh something known as the vehicle scrapping policy and what we've done is that now all old vehicles will have to pass a fitness test you know before they want re-registration and what we've done is that while we have not directly taxed you know while we've not directly taxed such vehicles you know because that would have led to a lot of animosity from the traditional ice industry or just the players but we you know spun it in a slightly different way what we've said is that if you want to renew your license after 15 years right we've increased the amount of registration fee that you will have to pay for it and similarly if you're actually you know kind of deregistering your vehicle which is older than 15 years if you're getting it scrapped right then what we do is that we have told the vehicle manufacturers to give you a discount of 5% uh on the total sale of the new vehicle that you are purchasing and the registration fees will also be waived off on the purchase of this new vehicle so there is an incentive and there is also a disincentive and of course this will go a long way in promoting the uptake of electric vehicles but also in terms of reduction of emission and also giving you know providing the impetus for the you know evolution of a local scrap industry uh, you know vehicle scrapping industry in the country as i said at the central level we taken a number of measures to incentivize the demand side and the supply side and this is applicable throughout the country so you you know you cannot have a state government saying that we have not received benefits because these schemes are applicable across the country but over and above this what we see is certain very proactive states of india which have announced incentives over and above what the central government already has to sort of offer them so for example the indian state of andhra pradesh they've talked about they've said that they will provide reimbursements on the state goods and services tax they will provide a waiver on electricity duty for 5 years they will provide you a financial incentive assistance or rather share 50% of your cost of fixed capital investment on ev manufacturing uh, similarly let's say the state of uttar pradesh which happens to be india's most populous state they've announced a capital interest subsidy infrastructure interest that subsidy reimbursement of you know the goods and services tax so states are mostly coming up with measures which are supply side as as they would be expected to and as you can see on the map on your right about 22 uh, of our states have actually announced their electric vehicle policies uh, and i think why states are also happy to do this is because they realize that all of them are anyway benefiting from the central assistance because you know the central assistance or the subsidies do not discriminate between states so it's it's for them and we've been encouraging them that you know i mean electric vehicles are going to be a big thing in india over the next few years so you know you should jump in to you know join in you know and we will provide you any help possible whether it's training your ev policies learning from the best practices uh, so on and so forth and just to end just to leave you with uh, you know a couple of pictures if you actually come to india or if you actually come to delhi you would see that just from a couple of years before there's a massive difference you know you would find charging infrastructure in any major market uh you know you would see it in housing societies in fact you would see uh you know charging infrastructure installed outside people's houses so it's something that's catching up on you know very quickly and we've seen people coming up with you know rather you know unique solutions so now there are agencies which have actually converted uh you know the junction boxes of lamp posts where you could actually connect and charge your uh you know electric vehicle which is the picture that you see on your uh you know on your right picture is pink so we've got really interesting solutions like that coming up uh you know in the country and we expect that this will only grow further but one of the challenges that we see is that uh, this this development is also slightly haphazard with different agencies jumping in to do things that uh you know uh, and not coordinating these efforts which is why it's very important uh you know to have coordinated efforts across the entire green mobility spectrum and e2 and as you see a scooter parked in the first picture there electric two wheeler sales in fact 
Ola Electric just launched uh, two variants of their, uh, you know, uh, electric scooter. And in 24 hours, uh, you know, they received 100,000 bookings. Uh, that's just in 24 hours. So, uh, I mean, imagine the kind of interest that, that there's there uh, for mobility, uh, which is electric uh, in certain Indian cities as of now. And what we've also seen is the emergence of a lot of startups, uh, you know, Aether Energy, uh, you know, these are all startups. I mean, the first, uh, you know, eight uh, logos that you see up there are all startups, uh, which have actually cropped up and they're actually doing really well. And of course, there's the bigger manufacturers also, uh, which are producing their electric vehicles. Uh, so I think that's, that's from my end, a brief overview of, you know, the electric mobility ecosystem, um, you know, in, in India and what are the policy instruments uh, that we've been able to deploy so far. And, you know, going forward, of course, there are a number of challenges, but I think going forward, the key would be to integrate efforts across state level, urban local body level and national level, uh, and also kind of integrate electric vehicles and shared mobility with the public transport network, because until and unless you have that planning, uh, you will only see, you know, development, which is kind of haphazard and which doesn't really serve the purpose of mobility, which is truly, uh, you know, sort of clean. So uh, from my end, uh, that is it. Uh, and uh, over to you, uh, Stephanie. I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that uh, my, uh, that anybody might have. So I'm stopping to share my screen. Thank you so much, uh, Siddharth. I think this is super inspiring to see how the national you know, level efforts in India really have trickled down to the regions and to the cities and how you are tackling the issue from so many different um, angles and with so many different stakeholders involved. I think that's uh, super impressive. Um, we were wondering if you could maybe briefly answer one question. Um, we're a bit uh, short of time, but if you could give your very quick insights into the question by Justin, which I think is really interesting. He's asking if it is possible for ASEAN countries to adopt a FAME policy given that there is an agreement between ASEAN countries to have zero or minimal custom duties if they are importing from each other. So really, you know, kind of taking your approach onto the regional scale um, and understanding if that's, if that's an option. What do you think? This is quite possible, uh, you know, but I, I mean, of course, this is something, look, I can tell you one thing that if, if a country like India can have fame policy, and this was a policy which was kind of, cross-cutting because in India, we've got so many different state governments. We've got over 750 districts and each district has its own administration, its own urban local body. Uh, so, I mean, if FAME scheme could succeed there, I feel that we could have something like, you know, if we could have something like this, but of course, this is, this is then a question which uh, has to, uh, you know, has to be, uh, you know, can only be sort of solved or answered once we have policymakers from all of uh, the Asian countries to, uh, you know, kind of agree to this. But I mean, sure, it does sound like a very practical, uh, you know, a very practical framework. And if countries do not insist on their own localization targets, then this is something that that could work. So I mean, there's the other question here is then do countries really also want to, you know, focus on localizing uh, the production? Because what countries are also trying to do is to season the you know, EV movement and also use it to promote domestic manufacturing. And I mean, at least that's what India is doing, right? So I think if all countries agree to this, then this is definitely something that we can. Yeah. So maybe that's food for a thought uh, as the next steps taking um, the approach onto a more regional level. Maybe one more question, just very briefly by Bushan, um, does India have any policies to promote and support the retrofitting of old ICE vehicles to electric? Um, and he's referring to Kerala, um, which seems to have some incentives on that. Yeah, that, that's correct. So one, so that's correct. So Kerala does have, uh, does have that kind of an incentive, but that's only one state which has it. Right now at the national level, uh, you know, right now at the national level, there's, there's no such policy, uh, you know, for the same. And uh, a majority of the states have not yet launched any such policy. Uh, and I think it was because, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, when discussions were actually held and we actually worked out, uh, you know, the costs for uh, retrofitting of vehicles versus, uh, you know, being able to scrap them and see the life cycle and see the life cycle costs of the entire process. 
we felt that scrapping was more economical and more states ex expressed their willingness to come on board because that doesn't just necessarily do away with the issue of uh, you know older vehicles but it's also promoting a scrap industry it's also promoting a recycling industry uh, you also have vehicle manufacturers giving a discount to the end user so i think it because of the multiplicity of factors that are there in scrapping policy versus retrofitting policy that we had more states on board for something like this but of course most states are free to do this you know so i mean over time if we see that the kerala model is economical there is nothing that actually stops from other states to actually do away with uh, you know the whole idea of retrofitting Thanks, Steffi and Sidar. So, yeah, as you would see, there are a, a lot of tools and opportunities to, to explore to decarbonize uh, transport through promotion of e-vehicles and also from their manufacturing until the promotion within an integrated and sustainable um, urban mobility scheme. Also, I get the, it was great to the overview of type of policies that we can incentivate from several disciplines and institutions. So I will be uh, I will thank Sidar for showing us uh, how policy making around e-mobility navigates differently and meets group of governments and institutions and stakeholders, of course, in a national and local level. Um, now we will have the opportunity to learn which kind of policies are being implemented in Asia for electric two and three wheelers. So I will hand it over to Bert from UN Environment Sustainable Mobility Unit in Asia Pacific. So please, Bert, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. Uh, let me just start to, yeah. And thanks as well for the previous speakers. I think it is very impressive to listen to the experience in India. Uh, just to put this in perspective, um, India was quite um, honestly late in the game, if you like. Uh, the electric vehicle, electric mobility movement has already, of course, uh, skyrocketed in China, uh, EU, uh, the US. But you see the comprehensive set of policies that Siddharth uh, described and uh, shown to us. It's truly impressive that is uh, able to promote or support uh, electric mobility in the country. And I know in the next uh, years to come, uh, India will also be a big player in terms of uh, manufacturing of uh, electric vehicles and uh, associated uh, requirements or parts. This uh, session is actually also very timely. Uh, I've read news now that uh, oil uh, per barrel is now uh, again $85 per barrel. And there are estimates that this would even go to $150 per barrel in 2023 or 2024. We don't know what if it's going to happen, but definitely this kind of uh, uh, news will be detrimental to low and middle income countries, especially in Asia Pacific. I'm going to talk about uh, policy, supposed to talk about policies on uh, electric two and three wheelers in Asia. We don't have that uh, breadth or much uh, uh, latitude in terms of knowing all the various policies in, uh, in Asian countries, but we have some. And we would like to share this. Uh, just to put again into context, Asia has the most number of conventional motorcycles and scooters in the world. Uh, traditionally, we have uh, been using these modes of uh, transport uh, in all, uh, in most of the countries from China, India, uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, we also see that uh, the emissions of uh, motorcycles and scooters can be substantial. The upper part of the graph shows uh, uh, CO2 emissions and the lower graph uh, shows particle emissions. And if you look at, this is an old slide, uh, by the way, uh, already, but if you look at uh, the third scooter, electric scooter, using the Chinese energy mix, uh, the CO2 emissions uh, is not also that high. And, and also the particle emissions is, is quite low as well, uh, even compared to uh, an advanced passenger car. In looking at uh, conventional two and three wheelers, I always like to put this into context uh, in terms of uh, the use of uh, two and three wheelers. It's good that uh, GIZ uh, with support from uh, Sudhir Gota has prepared uh, one of the source books that looks at uh, two and three wheelers. 
And in there, they outlined like, uh, okay, you have motorized two and three wheelers. And uh, these are, can be further divided into uh, private trips, commercial trips, uh, three wheelers as well, and also three wheelers used for informal public transport. And in Asia, we have all of this. It's definitely widely used for passenger and freight. It provides uh, livelihood for a majority of um, citizens, especially the lower income uh, sector. We have seen as well that uh, it has become indispensable with the rise of uh, e-commerce. I'm sure most of you have been ordering food online and these have been, are being delivered to you either by motorcycle or by bicycle. And uh, yeah, again, just further highlighting the importance of uh, uh, two and three wheelers in this uh, pandemic. It's also important for us, for us to, uh, to remember that a large percentage of urban trips are within six kilometers and easily covered by walking, cycling, electric bicycles and other two wheelers. I think uh, I've seen some uh, representatives from cities as well in this uh, training course. And I hope we put this into mind that uh, we need to support uh, facilities for other modes of transportation, like walking, cycling, especially because uh, this can easily be used for trips that are especially lower than uh, six kilometers. But having said this, uh, six kilometer trips and beyond or five kilometers, uh, you will see that the uh, electric, sorry, that uh, motorcycles and scooters are being widely used. Uh, this chart shows the global exports of bicycles and motorized two wheelers that uh, we have uh, in terms of global trade of vehicles. You see in 2019, uh, the number of bicycles being exported has uh, greatly increased. This also include uh, two wheelers and uh, while others like uh, light duty vehicles, freight vehicles, buses and vehicles and component has actually gone down um, in 2020, uh, 2019. And we've also seen a sharp increase in the trade of electric two wheelers. Uh, this is just a chart that shows from 2017, uh, where uh, they have uh, from uh, UN Comtrade and Trade Map, where they have integrated electric two and three wheelers, or sorry, electric two wheelers into the database. You can see that uh, the number of electric two wheelers have uh, greatly increased. Uh, I think I already mentioned uh, shorter trips and. Uh, uh, it's just important for this slide to take note of uh, lower speeds because this will be important later on when we talk about uh, the policies. In terms of the experience, yes, now in China, we have more than 300 million uh, electric two-wheelers. This started in the early 2000s. Uh, I would even say that the, initially it was not really stimulated uh, or driven by policy, but there were a number of urban policies that uh, influenced this. Several cities in China have banned uh, motorcycles or conventional motorcycles in city centers, and this has led to the increase of uh, electric two-wheelers. And uh, again, just to imagine all of this, uh, China has produced in 2020 113 million units of conventional two-wheelers, or maybe just say two-wheelers, uh, and at the same time, uh, 34 million units of this are electric. And uh, they have many uh, manufacturers uh, locally and uh, primarily it's sold domestically at the moment. And uh, actually I'm surprised, I thought this would be also much bigger, but in terms of uh, exports, uh, they only export 5% of this uh, electric two wheelers. It's also important to take note of the chart at the bottom. This is like uh, electric bicycle ownership uh, by household. And uh, if you see at the countryside and city comparison, uh, it says per 100 households and 75 per 100 households in the countryside own electric two wheelers. And in the city, this is uh, 58 uh, uh, units or 58 uh, electric 
uh, bicycles per household, per, per hundred households. So again, it's important to take note of that. I'm sorry, I was not able to get uh, a lot more in terms of uh, the policies uh, in China, but the chart, the table above shows a comparison of uh, their first uh, policies in 1999 compared to 2019. Uh, first, the electric two-wheeler is only should be about uh, 20 kilometers per hour with a maximum weight of 40 kilograms and engine power of 240 watts using a battery voltage of 36 volts. But in 2019, this was uh, <clears throat> increased uh, for maximum speeds of 25 kilometers per hour, uh, vehicle weight, uh, also equivalent engine power of 400 watts and battery voltage of 48 volts. And uh, it's also important to take note that electric two-wheelers having the maximum speed of 25 kilometers per hour in China are allowed allowed to use the bike lanes in uh, cities in China. In India, I would not uh, uh, go into detail, but uh, just to show you the scale, electric two-wheelers, they have 830,000 electric two-wheelers. This data comes from uh, P Manifold, who we invited for one of these uh, uh, webinars as well to report on the case of India. Uh, information is from 2019, 2020. So comparatively at that time, it was it had only 830,000 electric two-wheelers, but surprisingly, it already had 2.5 million electric three-wheelers. And again, this is something like the growth of the, the electric three-wheelers in uh, India, you can say was not initially supported by government policies. It was organically, uh, organically increased uh, and uh, was, uh, I guess, led by the market uh, to increase. We've heard about the FAME uh, subsidies, the FAME policy that are put in place. And these are all uh, very uh, important policies because it is clear. One of the things that Siddharth said, like for a complex country where you have several hundred uh, uh, or even a thousand uh, local government units from states to cities to municipalities, and uh, there is a national framework that is established, but ultimately it is the states that uh, uh, develop these policies. In 2020, or actually in 2019, we supported the state of Uttar Pradesh uh, to look into their policy on urban mo on uh, electric mobility. And that's the time also where they adopted specific targets for electric two-wheelers, three-wheelers, uh, buses, and also charging infrastructure. Uh, this was uh, 2019 already. And uh, now the government, the state government of Uttar Pradesh has uh, done quite a lot more. But another interesting thing here on this slide is the number of uh, engine, uh, or number of manufacturers, the OEMs in India. They have uh, more than 80 plus already for electric two wheelers and more than a hundred for electric three wheelers. Again, I guess we should say that this is driven by a national policy that would like to encourage local manufacturing. The question on ASEAN applicability of FAME or FAME, sorry, uh, definitely is possible, but ASEAN is a different uh, uh, institution altogether. And there are several big countries that have big manufacturing uh, uh, capabilities like Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, uh, to a certain extent, the Philippines, and all of these countries also want to stimulate local manufacturing. Maybe this is something that we can discuss uh, in more detail uh, later. Looking into Southeast Asia, there are very few. Um, in Vietnam has the most in terms of uh, electric two-wheelers. They have about 1.4 electric uh, two-wheelers already as of uh, last year in June. In Malaysia and Thailand, uh, only few in the Philippines, uh, mostly registered electric three-wheelers. Uh, we don't have comprehensive information on uh, manufacturers, but uh, we know that there are at least uh, 50 uh, in all the Southeast Asian countries uh, combined. And that's why, actually, when we started looking at this issue of electric two- and three-wheelers, we thought that the countries in Southeast Asia will face the exports coming from China and India. And uh, now it is the best time 
for countries to put in place uh, certain standards and policies. The next set of slides uh, that I have will talk about these uh, policies that are uh, made as guidelines uh, for Southeast Asian countries. Uh, this was developed by uh, experts uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, but together with the EV Association in Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and the network in uh, Vietnam. They don't have an association of electric vehicles uh, industry and experts as of the moment. Uh, so together with the experts, I mentioned Professor uh, Horizon Gitano and also Dr. Uh, Biona, uh, who I think is also presenting in this training course tomorrow, uh, helped us develop this. Before we go into the technical uh, regulations, we thought like we must also put policies or review policies on uh, uh, stimulating the use of electric two and three wheelers in general. So one is vehicle tax rationalization, uh, looking at the fees, looking at, uh, of course, having uh, lower fees for these types of vehicles, looking at insurance rationalization, uh, looking at uh, manufacturing support. We saw, uh, especially when these uh, policy guidelines were being developed, that most of the targets, uh, policies in Southeast Asian countries, primarily in Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia were geared towards uh, four wheelers, like they want to encourage more manufacturing of electric cars, but not so much on the two wheelers. And this is some, somewhere we think uh, we should uh, look into more. Another important aspect is public transport integration. Uh, we are not really able to look at this in detail and uh, associated electric two and three wheeler infrastructure uh, integration. When we talk about uh, infrastructure in integration, we must remember electric bicycles. Electric bicycles have an equal uh, opportunity to move a lot of people, especially when you uh, put in mind this uh, number that I said most, or 60% plus of, uh, or about 60% of all city trips, uh, urban trips are within six kilometers and uh, also for uh, preference for lower speeds or adequacy of using lower speed uh, vehicles to, uh, for, for this type of trips. So electric bicycles can definitely serve this purpose. I think the next set of slides, I will not go into detail. I would uh, focus and highlight a few things, but this is about uh, the countries in Southeast Asia or any country uh, for this matter who doesn't have enough technical standards and regulations as of yet uh, for looking at uh, uh, electric two and three wheelers. So definitely getting vehicle categories right is important. Uh, we just adopted this uh, also using the recommendations from the EU uh, and the UN in terms of speed. So pedestrian uh, speeds, low speed, low speed, intermediate and high speed uh, as a way of uh, categorizing vehicle categories. We need to look at uh, um, certain capacities, uh, parameters of these electric two-wheelers. And we thought these are all important in order to make sure that we have high quality or good quality electric two-wheelers coming into the market. This was also influenced by uh, initially there were a lot of low quality electric two-wheelers coming into many uh, Southeast Asian countries. And uh, definitely this is not good and uh, does not support um, the promotion of electric mobility in general. As such, uh, these uh, types of uh, regulations uh, should be put in place or should be considered. Looking at uh, uh, tests that looks at flooding and also rain, uh, rain tests. So we have included this in the uh, recommendations to guidelines. Vibration, drop test, knockover test. These are all important for uh, the, to test the durability of the products. Um, looking at insulation resistances, uh, short circuit uh, protection, uh, other technical aspect of the vehicle uh, needs to put in place. And uh, in the guidelines, we have provided more information. We also looked at uh, uh, regulations for lights, uh, noise devices. For noise devices, uh, 
we are not yet certain uh, how this will be handled uh, in detail, or maybe we should leave it to uh, each city, uh, each country in Southeast Asia, uh, because of, uh, of course, most of these vehicles are silent, and uh, in some cases you would need noisemakers so that you don't uh, you avoid uh, conflicts with pedestrians. But in terms of uh, other aspects like labeling, high voltage, battery recycling, uh, these are some of the elements that should be put in place. We have uh, a few more of these uh, uh, technical guidelines. On the table, uh, this is where perhaps we should reflect on. This is a recommendation on where the electric two-wheelers can uh, run. If it's pedestrian speed, so less than 10 kilometers per hour, Recommendation is off-road only, uh, using bike paths or sidewalks. Slow is the 10 to 25 kilometers per hour. And this should be all roads, uh, urban residential roads, or maybe you say low speed roads, so except highways. Uh, medium speed and high speed, uh, these are like comparable to motorcycles and uh, should be regulated the same as uh, motorcycles. There are also recommendations in terms of vehicle registration uh, policy. Uh, in the chart, uh, in the data from India, you, um, I think if we can remember that uh, electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers that have less than uh, 25 kilometers per hour maximum speed doesn't need to be registered. Um, of course, it's up to the country, um, I guess even also for each state or city uh, to regulate this. But our recommendations are similar. For pedestrian speed or slow speed, these are up to a maximum of 25 kilometers per hour, no registration needed. And uh, for the rest, you have uh, registration as optional, but for medium speed and high speed, definitely this is something that should be regulated the same as motorcycles. Driver license requirements uh, and safety equipment uh, requirements using of helmets, uh, we have provided some guidance. Also in terms of weight, you will see here four wheelers. There are also light electric vehicles. Uh, there are many in China that are now also being exported or manufactured in Southeast Asia. And we also need to regulate this. And uh, these are like quad bicycles or, or quad EVs. Uh, that are slowly coming into the market, but low speed. And these are some of the uh, categories that would, we have put in place. We have been working uh, together with the other donors, uh, project, uh, sorry, uh, other partners uh, supported particularly by the government of uh, Germany, the International Climate Initiative, to look into detail on uh, supporting electric two and three wheelers in uh, Southeast Asia and East Africa. And uh, we have been looking at uh, fiscal policies, regulatory policies, uh, consumer information or labeling, and we do this together with uh, local partners. Uh, example in uh, the Philippines, in the city of Pasig, together with Philippine Post, but I think you will hear more about this from other people throughout this uh, uh, training course. Similarly for Vietnam, Vietnam is also developing uh, their own policy now on battery swapping. And this is something that I haven't uh, discussed, but uh, many of the Southeast Asian countries are looking into this policy. Uh, similarly for Thailand, Thailand has specific production uh, and use targets for uh, electric uh, two-wheelers, electric cars, electric buses, but they have also adopted more policies for uh, electric two-wheelers. Uh, including labeling, uh, which is, should help encourage adoption of these vehicles. So for the last slide, maybe just lastly, uh, I just want to focus on the third slide. If we, uh, as we start developing these policies on electric two and three wheelers, we must uh, try to put it into perspective, integrating this into the NDCs, energy efficiency policies, Local transport planning and regulations. This is very important. There are many three wheelers, especially in the Philippines, uh, also in Cambodia that are being used for public transport. These are being regulated by local, uh, uh, local authorities, not national authorities. But we need to, to assess like uh, the feasibility of the routes, the number of units to make uh, the business viable, 
all these things. So maybe what I'm trying to say, it's not just replacement of the technology, but we need to look at the whole system as well. And uh, maybe last, uh, the fourth point on electrification of urban freight and waste management, there is huge potential for electric two and three wheelers use and uh, also e uh, electric cargo bikes. So I think I stop here. Thank you very much. The question on the policy guidance on increasing women's adoption of commercial electric two-wheelers exactly. and three-wheelers. No? We don't yeah. have this specific guidance as of the moment, but in East Africa, together with the FLOAN initiative, it's called, uh, uh, we are looking at the role of, uh, yeah, you can say increasing women's participation. But in this research, for example, highlighting what's being done in East Africa, particularly in Kenya, like we see that uh, in terms of manufacturing, operations, and use of uh, uh, two-wheelers, that uh, motorcycle, taxis, if you like, in, in Kenya, the role of women are, are very small. So this uh, study that uh, we have conducted with the Clone Initiative, we are looking at, okay, how to make electric two-wheelers and electric two-wheelers more uh, women-friendly. But having said that, in Nepal, like uh, the electric three-wheeler that has been there for a long time, maybe one of the first uh, in the world in terms of uh, commercial operations of electric three-wheelers are being run by many women and also being supported in terms of participation. But I would say that definitely we can do more in uh, providing uh, more explicit guidance and support for the, for the role of women in this uh, sector. Thank you. Today, I, I introduced shortly about the South Korea and the Seoul EPOS strategies and the related government strategies as well. Uh, I will shortly introduce myself. I, I'm the CEO of the EBO and I'm the electric safety trainer here and uh, providing the sub solution for the electric vehicle and uh, consulting about the electric charging infrastructure and the light small electric vehicle and the PPEs. Um, maybe you already know the South Korea is one of the biggest and the major market in electric vehicle and the electric market is getting increased very fast. And uh, President Moon uh, recently announced that uh, South Korea will, uh, will uh, accomplish the net zero uh, by the 2050. And that means that um, most of the vehicles in the South Korean market need to be changed to the non-zero uh, non emissions uh, from the 2030, 2031, 2035. So in South Korea market and uh, the, the original target in the South Korea then by the 2020 is the uh, 0.2 million liter vehicle. Uh, right now, the almost done uh, right now at current stage, 0.18 million. So target is almost finishes even the during the uh, corona issue. Without the corona issue, the, the numbers should be over than the target. The uh, hybrid vehicle, the target is uh, 0.8 million to right now to over the 0. Point, now right now the 0. 0.082 uh, hybrid vehicle. What about the first electric vehicle, you know that the uh, South Korea Hyundai is the one of the top uh, makers about the first electric vehicle. And uh, right now the, the 13,000 first electric vehicle now populated in South Korea. So very rapid increase is expected in the next year. So to meet the, this kind of the market trend, uh, the South Korea announced the uh, electric vehicle vision and the targets and the policies uh, from 2019. In 2019, the government announced that uh, we're going to start to the uh, future mobility society uh, targets 2030. So up to 2030, and uh, South Korea is the number one mobility, future mobility society. And the electric vehicle, pure electric vehicles, the uh, market share will be num number one. Uh, we're going to try to beat the Norway as well. And uh, the tag, one of the targets is autonomous vehicles uh, up to level 4, 2027. And 2020, uh, the government announced the new target, 
and very fast. And the government announced that 2022, in the next year, is the future mobility population, and we're going to start to the new era. And the 2025 electric vehicle target is 1.1 million, fuel electric vehicle 0.2 million, and just for the domestic market. And the two, by the 2025, electric vehicles are 0.53 million car. And the battery, you know that the South Korea, the battery maker very famous, and the LG Energy and Solution, SK Innovation, Samsung SDI, is a very top supplier about the electric vehicle battery side. And the huge amount of the USD dollars and export will be expected by the 2025. So in the for about the autonomous vehicle side, that the target is the two thousand by the two thousand twenty-two world number one autonomous vehicle up to level three, and our target is to using the level four and by the two thousand twenty-four. That means very fast. So in South Korea, uh, there are many kind of the electric vehicle and immobility e and the latest policies and projects and uh, in parallel. Uh, especially, for, especially for the Jeju Island, uh, they uh, have some projects about the electric vehicle charging plus services. And John Jolanamdo, and there, the, there is a small e-mobility project. And Jolabukdo is a special purpose EV like a big commercial truck and uh, heavy heavy machinery and the others. And Gyeongnam is the uh, making some project about our membership. And Ulsan is famous for the Hyundai uh, factories located in there. And they are trying to have some project about the green mobility and the fuel electric vehicle. Gyeongbuk is famous for the battery recycling. And Gangwon is the electric vehicle platform and the logistic EV. Nam is the autonomous vehicle project. So most of the South Korean uh, area is populated some uh, projects related to the future mobility and the new energy solutions and the others as well to meet the government target. In the South Korean market, uh, keep increasing the electric vehicle and the hybrid and the fuel electric vehicles. So as I say to you, it, it, this graph just including the uh, numbers until the April in this year, but right now the October, the number is uh, increased as well. So the uh, alternative fuel vehicle is uh, right now is uh, 100 million, total 100 million in South Korea. And the speed is getting increased and increased. We, we hope that uh, if the COVID issue has gone or the uh, situation is much better, then the, the numbers will be increased very fast. And we have, uh, you know, that Hyundai Ioniq 5 and the Kia EV6 is uh, launching recently, and uh, the order is and the customer demand is very increased as well. So the electric vehicle market is good expected. And for the regionally, the Seoul, the capital of the South Korea, is the number one electric vehicle market right now. Uh, before the 2000, uh, before the uh, until the uh, on, Till the uh, last year, the Jeju Island is the number one market in South Korea, but right now it's the Seoul. And uh, it seems that uh, Seoul is the biggest market in South Korea for a long time. The so Seoul is the number one market, and the next one is the, around the capital area. So the, the around the Seoul area, there's a big market expected. How about the e-bus system? Uh, there are many kind of the bus systems and the government will give the, some subsidy program for the electric buses. So we have the three local manufacturers like Hyundai, Kia, and Edis Motors, and the Wujin, and Jaildo, and the Korean Hyundai uh, electricity has the longest distance, and the Korea electric bus using the mostly the carbon body, so the cost is very high, expensive than the China one. So the, right now, the China company is getting into South Korea and uh, uh, up to three third percent is a South China, China electric vehicle, electric bus, and uh, the others is the Korean. And this is a public electric vehicle charging infrastructure systems in South Korea, especially in the around in the Seoul area. 
So we have the best chargers uh, totally mm, up to uh, to 10,000 uh, all around in South Korea and mostly located in the, the capital in Seoul area. And so right now, right now, so it's the number uh, second second area of the public EV charging infrastructure, and uh, around the Seoul is the number one, and the slow chargers and the fast chargers. Uh, there are many chargers right now, and uh, Seoul and the government have some plan to spread out the more electric vehicle charging infrastructures in South Korea uh, from next year, and we will be increasing as well. So I will show today about uh, uh, explain the policies of uh, the Seoul cities. So Seoul cities announced that the green policy about the transportation and uh, all system, uh, city systems. So they set up the green transportation area in the Gangnam area. Maybe you, uh, most of the people know about the Gangnam for the Gangnam start. Mm. And Yoido and the smart e mobility and the EPO system, they spread it out and then change the old vehicles step by step. And to make it better, the Seoul e mobility policy uh, tried to pursue and advance the smart mobility area with the autonomous vehicle and the logistic hub center will be uh, set up from the next year, early next year. And uh, they set up the green and the clean area in the special area. And in special area, the, the carbon free, carbon free, carbon free area. So the uh, internal combustion engine vehicle does not allow to enter in this area. So only eco friendly vehicle and the e-bus, pure electric vehicle bus can be, uh, can be around in there. And they want to have some smart optimized and the demand response systems. Uh, so they can monitoring and controlling the transportation in real time, and uh, they will upgrade their emission regulation. Talk about the e-bus, uh, they, they have a plan to spread out the 400 e-bus systems to the Seoul area, only for Seoul area. And the city bus is up to 300 and the other is the small town bus. And they have a plan to replace the internal combustion engine bus system to the electric vehicle step by step. How about the first electric vehicle? They have a plan to spread out, uh, supply the 40 first electric vehicle bus and the 2021 on, in this year. And they will set up the six charging station for the hydrogen you know, charging systems. And they have a plan to, for example, like in public park in Namsan area, there is a mountain and the only electric bus uh, could be uh, running uh, around the, this park. And the, right now, then the 10 bus, 10 e buses right now, and the, from the next year, 15 more e buses will be running in this area and they spread out. And they have a, a different kind of the plan about the e-tax as well. So they will support the various programs for the to support the e-taxi. And as I said to you that the, right now the, the long distance electric vehicle now populated in South Korea like a Ioni 5 and the EB6. So the taxi driver uh, tried to change the electric vehicle very fast because the, they got a subsidy and the low uh, maintenance fee and uh, low repairs. Uh, so that's why they select the uh, IWIN 5 and the EB6 for their next tax services. How about the autonomous vehicle in Seoul area? They have some uh, pilot programs in several areas in Seoul and co work with advanced competition like uh, Spring Cloud and the Navia in France. And they have many projects around in the Seoul and the other cities as well. So right now, the 50 electric uh, autonomous vehicle bus system now under evaluation. And the seven bus companies load routine right now. And maybe in the uh, next year, they will increase their area, learning area and from next year. In the 2021 target in Seoul, Seoul policy, uh, they, they spread out uh, about 11,000 11, 
thousand electric vehicle in this year and support the uh, fast charging systems 200 up to 300 and the light duty passenger vehicle taxi bus commercial vehicle even the two heat driver and they have some subsidy program in Saudi Arabia because the, there are many customer demands to change the electric vehicle right now and they have some program to support the e-taxi and the, even the school bus for what the fuel cell vehicles right now they have uh, up to 900 fuel cell electric vehicle and the tax programs as well so they set up the six plus fuel cell electric vehicle charging stations uh, around in Seoul area and uh, right now target is total 2.5k fuel cell electric vehicle around in Seoul area and the next year target is a 5,000 very fast so for about the e-bus system, this is the target and the plan of the uh, from the Seoul city. So Seoul city have a plan to uh, have some uh, big town bus uh, up to 4,000 until the 2026, and uh, for the small bus, uh, small bus is up to 600 and by the 2026. I have no idea why their gap is getting down in 2024. <laughs> So this is some example about the electric bus systems right now around in the Seoul area and uh, especially for the Seoul area. Yeah. Now they changed the uh, electric vehicles or the CNG bus or the LNG, LNG bus very rapidly and they uh, changing and the replacement from the old vehicles is getting fast. And the uh, distance is getting uh, getting longer. So recently, Seoul announced the e-bus standard. Uh, this is the Korean Korean words, but I can translate it. And if you want, and I can uh, share in the uh, translate um, technical specification. Uh, this is some specification and from the Seoul and uh, you can find out for your references. Uh, for example, like a battery, uh, battery, is, uh, battery capacity over 2000 kilowatt and the charging speed is uh, 26 kilowatt per minute. And especially for the winter season, you know that the summer season will be better. So the uh, target is uh, based on the winter season. So efficiency is 0.7 kilometer per kilowatt hour. And the charging port you're using, the, uh, using right now in the combo two combo to tire because the two uh, distinguish the passenger vehicle because the in South Korea now using the passenger vehicle using combo one so the bus system using the combo two uh, to not make some computer so battery warranty and the motor warranty and the electric the other components like the inverter and the others uh, more more than five years of the warranty and the test report is required for the local test lab certification. And the about the performance and the layouts and the, the dimension is length is, is around 11 meters in the length and seat should be more than 20, 23 seat. And the vehicle monitoring and the remote control system uh, is required to operate in this kind of the e-bus systems. And the after service center and the network is required to support the electric vehicle uh, bus systems. And for about the, search, uh, for about the passenger uh, satisfactions and the handicapped person support and the heater uh, should be included should be included in the bus system and the air cleaner US report um, is integrated together to support the passengers. And there are several news in South Korea, as I said to you, the, right now the electric vehicle population is getting fast in South Korea, and especially in the truck, one ton truck is very popular. And um, many uh, business people are looking for the Hyundai one ton truck and Bongo yeah, now selling very fast. And there are special purpose of the complex charging station is announced in the, by the GS is one of the biggest group, SK as well, in the biggest group as well. They have a fuel station network in South Korea, around uh, 5,000. And uh, their 
right now they opened uh, their complex station and they are all together, like a conventional fuel station and the hydrogen charging station, fuel station, LPG station, and electric charging station, convenience store, coffee shop, laundry shop, logistic service, and all together. Yeah. So I think that this kind of model will be a good example to your area as well. And recently, Hyundai, especially uh, they, they are using and learning their own electric charging solutions, and the name is EPIT. And the electric charging system in there is up to 350 kilowatt because the recent electric vehicle up to 800 volt. So the, in 15 minutes, they can charge up to 50% of the vehicles. And they will use them for the public charging station. And if you want to find the more uh, technical things, then uh, this is some example. Uh, this is my final page, and uh, please let me know or the contact by this email if you have any questions. Thank you very much. I am Qiu Yang Lu. I am a transport engineer at ITDP. And um, today I will be sharing some of the experiences and the lessons learned from implementing electric bus systems in China. Um, I will be starting with a very brief inter overview of the current status of electric buses. And then I will be talking about so what drives the uh, such significant adopt uh, large uh, adaptation of the electric bus in China. And also I will be sharing some of the real world operational data and also the charging, inf charging um, data. And finally, at, at the city level, I will be sharing the, um, how Shenzhen fully electrified its bus fleet. And I will be, and in the first, in the first section, um, so the, the new energy vehicles actually is a term used only by the Chinese government to represent three types of uh, electric vehicles, and they are the they are the battery electric vehicles and uh, the hybrid electric vehicles and also the full full scale electric vehicles. And we can see that the proportion of the new energy buses in China has seen, has been increased significantly over the recent years, and and also. And specifically in 2020, the number of the proportion of new energy buses has reached over 65% in China nationwide. And if we break down the energy types by uh, energy types of the um, of the of all the bus fleets in China, we we can see that the battery electric vehicles. Uh, accounts for over half. Uh, so in this slide, I, I, I said it's um, necessary to look into the detailed figures in different um, provinces and also cities because the geographical region is really large in China. And um, in 2020, the national average proportion of new energy buses uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it has already been over 60% uh, in all provinces. And we can also see that almost all provinces uh, has increased their proportion of new energy buses um, because of their uh, strong incentives to promoting the new energy buses. And if, uh, if we break it down the figures by the cities, we can, and the national average proportion is, um, is, is also over 60%. And, uh, and there are several cities have already, have already reached 100% of, the new, of the, the new energy buses in 2020, which include the Changsha city, which is located in the central of China. Um, so what drives such uh, large scale implementation of electric buses in China? And um, the most important factor is a uh, strong policy incentives. And so since 2019, the national, the national government uh, has released uh, many, many financial support policies to, um, to, in order to promote the electric, electric bus development in China. 
And I will be talking about this in detail later about what, uh, what financial supports are available right now. And also the electric bus industry um, also ensures that uh, the electric bus are available to use and also it drives the accelerating of the technology improvement. We found that the cities with electric bus manufacturers have the largest proportion of electric buses, uh, which is also a um, says what the reason why the electric bus industry is uh, very important as well. And also, I want to say that uh, the environmental pressure um, also plays an important role. Um, and the national, the national governments set many ambitious electrification targets to the, to the different regions and provinces uh, that have severe air pollution issues. Um, and this reason drives, uh, also drives uh, the large adaptation of electric buses at the, at the local level. And finally, the, in the availability of the infrastructure also ensures the efficiency of the electric bus daily operations. Um, in regarding the, uh, the different financial supports by the national government, and uh, the first one is the purchasing, uh, electric bus purchasing subsidies. And the subsidies, um, the subsidies are set based on different uh, electric bus technologies and also the different the different size of the bus. The longer the bus is, the more subsidies the, uh, the, lo the local governments will be receiving. Um, and and um, the, the amount of the subsidies uh, is, uh, is also decreasing over the recent years because of the, uh, the, the technology improvements and also the larger proportion of electric buses in China right now. In, and apart from the purchasing subsidy and the operational subsidies also plays a very important role to support the local governments and, and to accelerating the electric bus adaptation. Um, so operational subsidies it, um, uh, is released to bus operators who uh, is released to buses, electric buses that operate over uh, 30,000 kilometers per year. And also the bus operators need to apply for such a subsidy. And the figure, and also the figure is, uh, will be verified by the Ministry of Transport. And then it will be issued to the bus operators directly. Finally, is the uh, charging infrastructure subsidy. And um, I think over the, um, in the recent years, the national government is gradually moving, is gradually decreasing the subsidy for the purchasing of electric buses, but it is increasing the subsidy for the charging infrastructure and also of the daily operations. Um, and the, the charging infrastructure subsidies are, um, is set, are set based on the, on the number of char charging stations that are built and also it is based on the um, based on the different regions because and um, because in different regions the uh, they have different target of target of the electrification goals um, here i showed you an example in beijing tianjin hebei and peoria delta and the yangtze river, river delta area and the, the, sub, the charging infrastructure subsidies are increasing, um, or are increasing year by year. And next, I want to share some of the real world of um, electric bus performance data. And the first one is the daily operational dis distance, uh, the daily operational distance per day. Um, here, the figure showed you uh, that the average driving mileage of a, uh, of a battery electric bus in China is uh, 133 kilometers in 1919, um, sorry, in 2019, uh, which increased 88% compared with last year, and which showed the improve, the continuous improve, technology improvement 
And, uh, but however, if we compare it with a hybrid electric bus, and the figure is slightly lower. And the, for a hybrid electric bus in China, the average driving mileage per, per day is 167 kilometers. And so we can still, we can see there is still a gap to improve. Um, also, I mean, if we break down the, uh, the operational distance um, by different regions, and um, this is uh, by cities, and uh, the average operational distance um, per day for a pure electric bus um, was slightly higher um, in the major cities in China, which was 139 kilometers in 2019. And also the largest, uh, the longest operational distance um, was achieved in Lanzhou city, which is also located in the central of China. And it has a, uh, it has a uh, average daily driving mileage of over 200 kilometers per day. And here I want to also want to share the energy consumption um, per a hundred um, per a hundred kilometers drive, and um, because um, because the energy consumption could be very different um, based on the different climate, different climate, uh, and also the different uh, horizons. Um, so here we can see that the uh, in the south the south China and and in the North China has the largest uh, energy consumption because, uh, because in these regions, um, the, the extreme weather period would be longer than in other regions. So which, uh, de which decreased the, um, and at the battery performance of an electric bus. Um, in, in this section is um, the driving infrastructure um, because this um, in China there uh, actually the most uh, uh, the uh, the mostly adopted charging system is um, plug-in system. It has the advantage of a lower initial capital cost, and it could also make the best use of charging at night, which not, not which not only put less pressure on the grid network, but also um, help the bus operators to reduce the charging um, cost because the electricity cost in at night is slightly uh, is slightly lower than it in the, it in uh, in the daytime um, but for the plug-in system it requires more space than uh, to build the charging infrastructure and uh, so currently in China we are um, cons we are considering the pantograph charging system which uh, which uh, which requires less uh, which doesn't require any space, um, and it could also be uh, it could be also charging the buses very fast, but uh, the high, the capital cost uh, is very high initially. So we are, and here I want to share some of the charging data. Um, in terms of the charging beginning state of charge distribution, um, most of the, uh, so 60 to 70 percent of the state of charge is the most common, uh, it is most commonly used when charging begins, and, uh, inter and also for uh, the charging time distribution. So we can see that most of the best operators are making best use of the uh, charging at night. Uh, the peak charging hours are, are during um, are, are from 10 p.m. at night to 4 a.m. And uh, we can also see a very small charging peak here at appears at noon um, from 11 to from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And finally, I want to share with you the case of Shenzhen City. 
and so Shen, uh, and how how Shenzhen fully electrified its bus fleet. And so Shenzhen's electrification journey starts uh, starts in 2009, and when Shenzhen was selected as a electric vehicle city pilot city, and at the same year it finished the. Uh, bus operators integration, where several private bus operators are merged into three large bus companies. And uh, in following in, 20, in 2011, Shenzhen adopted 200 electric buses and also launched the, its first fully electric bus route. Um, moving on to 2015, Shenzhen, uh, in order to solve the the capital cost problem, it explored a very new business model in China. Sorry. Um, and where Shenzhen rent a rent e buses and also and um, batteries from the manufacturers. Um, and this helped the Shenzhen bus group to greatly ease the pressure of the high capital cost. Um, in in, tw in 2017, Shenzhen finally um, has the number of new energy buses reached over 60,000, and and also it has the full electrification of the buses, and the figure is continuing to improve on, until today. And um, this is the statistical figures of how it's the number of electric, uh, a number of new energy buses uh, in Shenzhen, how it evolved over the recent years. Um, uh, I want to, I also want to highlight Shenzhen's innovative business model, uh, where this model helped the Shenzhen bus group to uh, transfer its, uh, its risks to several external stakeholders, including the financial leasing company, uh, who um, uh, who provide the electric bus to the bus operators and the electric bus manufacturer who is in charge of the da bus daily maintenance and also the charging service provider who provides the charging services. Um, so the so the bus operator um, on, could could focus only on the daily bus or operations and uh, not worrying about the high capital costs and also other risks. This, this innovative business model is then adopted by many uh, other bus operators in, in Chinese cities. Um, here I listed several policies um, policies support from the government at all levels over, over the recent years. I wouldn't go through the details here because of, because of the time constraints, but you can review this later. Um, and Shenzhen's success, success also comes from a very, a, a very efficient electric bus system. And the bus is, um, Shenzhen's journey all started with a very successful pilot, uh, pilot project. And also in, within the electric bus system, it has, um, it considers the charging plans, the, the fleet size scheduling and the route planning and also considering the bus, uh, the battery capacity and range and how, how to charge and how, and where the charging facilities are located and also, also working with the grid um, electric, uh, electricity grid companies to to ensure the grid capacity could be uh, could meet the needs by the electric buses. And here on the right hand side, I I showed you several pictures of the uh, user friendly interface um, uh, by in in this efficient electric bus system, um, we, and in the, and how the the so data is managed also plays a very important role to um, to ensure the daily operations are uh, are optimized and and the efficient the maximum efficiency is achieved. 
Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, and at, at last, I think I, I also want to share with you two reports. Uh, one is from, one is by ITDP. Is, um, it, the first one is, uh, is the, a very systematic review of the electric bus systems. And it also provided um, um, brief in cases in the world. And in the last, uh, and the second report is by the World Bank. It is published recently. It gives you a very detailed case study of the how of Shenzhen's of the Shenzhen bus group. And uh, so I, I strongly suggest you to uh, have a look if you are interested and want to learn more. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I I look forward to have further discussion with you on this topic. Thank you very much, Ms. Lu Qiyang, for your great presentation and your input on the policy-oriented uh, EBUS development in the terms of uh, public policy as a major driver in promoting the electrification of bus fleets, and also the manufacturer sector engaged to the ambitious government targets to reduce uh, pollution issues. Also for this time, I want to highlight the presentation on charging infrastructures and also the collection of data on charging which I believe is a key aspect uh, we, when we want to make informed decisions. And finally, the experience from Xinjiang experience, uh, yeah, with its innovative business model, which bring together different stakeholders and establish partnerships to a structure EBUS system. Um, so thank you very much for your presentation. Now I will welcome Aida from UTP to give us a look to the European Clean Bus Platform. Thank you, Aida, for being here with us. So I hand it over to you. Thank you, Carolina. And I will shift the, the scope of, uh, of, the, of, this, of this topic and we'll share with you some of the, uh, of the, main, uh, of the main drivers in, uh, in Europe. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Aida Tula. I am senior manager of the uh, VAS unit at the Knowledge and Innovation Department at URTP. Uh, for those who don't know UITP yet, UITP is the International Association of Public Transport, and uh, our mission is to enhance uh, quality of life and economic well-being by promoting uh, and supporting uh, sustainable, clean uh, uh, public transport in cities. Uh, we have uh, above uh, yeah, 1,800 member companies uh, from 100 different countries and regional offices, and definitely uh, we rely a lot on the uh, extensive network of stakeholders we, we put together in our membership. We have uh, public transport authorities, operators, but also the uh, industry uh, chain, uh, research, uh, etc. So we are proud of being quite diverse in this sense. Uh, activities we cover logically you know, first uh, advocacy, we promote uh, all the benefits uh, of public transport and we try to keep it at the top of the policy agendas. We, of course, uh, network uh, to different activities with, uh, with our members and other organizations. I think that's also the value you know, of, uh, of, uh, of projects like, like uh, Solutions Plus. We are we are uh, in, in the right framework today and definitely also you know, promoting the creation and elicitation of knowledge, not just uh, through research and innovation projects, but also different activities in this sense. First, perhaps to start with, uh, yeah, with a bit more of a meta level uh, look, um, we face all you know, global challenges, but these challenges are also opportunities which for me translate into the right drivers when we identify them in the proper way. Um, the need for, for clean buses is something that we have seen uh, already in the last uh, decades. Uh, there is not just uh, yeah, big issues in cities, especially in densely populated cities. We have the example of, of Chinese cities. I think there, there is uh, Definitely, the good action and the good point of leverage has been has been set up already. We talk about climate change at the global level as a, as a planet, but we also face uh, local uh, urban pollution, congestion, definitely, and noise uh, in many cases. And also, when we talk at the vehicle level, we also have the vibrations, no, of the internal combustion engine buses. 
uh, as uh, as of today still no urban transport in europe represents uh, yeah accounts for 40% of the co2 emissions this is of course uh, a number that we're trying to to reduce uh, and you know that uh, at least uh, the European Commission has been releasing different actions and policies uh, with the purpose of, of uh, making uh, urban transport much more clean and sustainable. Um, issue is that for the last decades, uh, diesel buses uh, account not for the largest part of the urban bus fleets, and basically, the the yeah the speed of uh, yeah the fleet renewal is more or less. Uh, Following the the cycle, uh, the life the lifetime cycle of the uh, of the buses is eight ten years. So we have more or less eight percent of the bus fleet renewed every year. Of course, um, this differs for different uh, operators, but basically that's an average we can consider. Um, this said, um, not just because of the of the policy set in place now, but also because. Uh, Public transport operators in Europe have been really committed to to reduce uh, to reduce emissions and to contribute to this uh, to this increase of quality of life in cities. So that's a priority. So renewal is definitely a priority for the urban uh, bus stakeholders. And this uh, this even considering that that might be some uh, some still for some of them uh, because we have very good examples already of uh, best practices, but we still see. There might be a bit of concerns about the technological maturity and the initial high uh, capex costs. No, when it comes to the to the implementation of clean buses, still one thing I, I believe it's uh, it's very important to keep always in mind is that uh, in order to make uh, public transport uh, thrive again, what we do need is to provide uh, high quality, excellent services, a seamless uh, seamless uh, offer of. Um, of public transport that is able to 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 attract, no? to make uh, to make uh, people choose uh, public transport over private modes. And for this, especially now when we talk about the starting post-pandemic period, I think it's a really a key point to to bear in mind when we when we start designing how to build back better. Um, let me just um, yeah, share with you some of the local, I call it local challenges, because each operator in each city is dealing with this uh, um, in, in a specific way. Um, what we have seen during this pandemic, and it, this is a global effect, it's not just a, a regional effect, is that we have uh, a drastic uh, reduction of the ridership and with it the revenues um, of, uh, of, uh, bus, uh, of bus operators. This, of course, poses the question: What happens now when we have uh, plans for uh, fleet renewal? Uh, what happens if my revenues, of course, have decreased that dramatically? Now we can talk more or less about a recovery uh, of a maximum levels of 80% of the ridership compared with the 2019 pre-pandemic uh, uh, levels. Basically, if we consider that one of the first, uh, one of the first. Uh, uh, investments you will have to to face is, for instance, the depot upgrade, meaning you need to convert your depot to the needs of the new technology introduced, charging infrastructure considered, but also perhaps you need an increased surface to be able to allocate the charging infrastructure plus um, a, a higher number of buses that needed no, for, for your operation with a specific technology. These are things that uh, need to be considered. Also, uh, in order to make this possible, uh, there is a need of, of uh, yeah, finding uh, appropriate uh, funding and uh, financing mechanisms. Not also, in order to to have the right business models that can make that this um, that this share of the technology technological risk and 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 the uh, associated uh, investment costs are fairly distributed. We have seen examples how, for, for instance. Uh, the uh, the innovation innovative business model of, of Shenzhen uh, and uh, many other Chinese cities, no, as presented by our colleague from ITDP. Also, we see this in Latin America, no. Uh, uh, in the example of Santiago de Chile, for instance, it's, it's very it's very inspiring in this sense. So, if we focus now, what happens uh, next? Basically, uh, what I would like to highlight is that instead of Posing a challenge, um, what clean bus technologies and the introduction, or let's say 
the the push from from the government to to support and introduce uh, clean bus technologies in uh, in bus fleets today is a golden opportunity definitely so we have the chance to be able to uh, give a new face to what uh, the bus to what bus systems are in our cities because that's an in, uh, we are introducing an innovation which is bringing more comfort and environmental friendliness not to the uh, to the transporting in in the city also considering that that's the reality that we have um, that we, we have experienced during the pandemic so fear of uh, or even some governments no, from, uh, telling their, their citizens avoid public transport. Now we need to slowly no, gain the, 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 the pace back and be able to, uh, to give our, our passengers uh, the trust back on a safe and reliable public transport. So that's uh, the challenge we, we face at the operational level. Uh, and the good news is that we have seen an amazing uh, leadership by cities, by cities around Europe, by cities also around the world, uh, which show that this, this, uh, these stakeholders you know, are the main, the main, uh, the main actors of the, uh, of the transition, of the energy transition we need to see around in Europe. So um, we have seen that there is many many actions but basically what we see is that there is a, a policy framework set in Europe I will present you in the next slide but we have uh, cities that have uh, let's say topped the, uh, the targets established by these uh, by these policies and have gone even beyond these targets we have examples uh, like Hamburg, Paris, Amsterdam but also Moscow for instance some of these cities they have uh, decided not to purchase any diesel bus anymore as of 2020 or 2021 and they have increased the number of uh, of uh, battery electric buses in this case also sometimes in the case of Paris it's also CNG buses natural gas buses but um, yeah the, the good the good path is is undergo definitely and for instance, we have uh, already six um, six uh, countries in 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 Western Europe that have introduced in total no uh, over 20 per, uh, 25 percent of the new registrations of 2020 with uh, battery electric and fuel cell buses. That's fantastic news. And most of the drivers we see for this is of course not only uh, the national and the in some cases the regional legislation but also of course the uh, the european no the european uh, union legislation and even uh, so, uh national levels like uh, yeah paris agreement etc so um this said um what we need uh every time no to to keep uh, to keep in mind is is, is the need of, of having the stakeholders bundled together so when we have uh, when we have a, a, a new fleet renewal exercise, uh, the cooperation and uh, to create the solid uh, uh, joint work with uh, with all stakeholders is key, and this is uh, shown by the innovation, innovative business models as we have uh, that we have uh, commented uh, before. So, what is the role of policy? So, basically, of course, we see uh, that this. Uh, the purpose, the main purpose is to boost the, uh, the introduction or, or the penetration in the market of, of these technologies. And we see that, uh, yeah, this is some examples of what is happening in Europe, but as I mentioned before, it's uh, basically policies uh, on decarbonization and clean technologies, not that are pushing both, are encouraging both, not just uh, the market, but also the cities, cities towards uh, clean buses and clean bus fleets. We have the Paris Agreement, which is showing all the, this is, is uh, the global transition towards a low carbon economy. It's not just relating to e-buses, but it's in general how to uh, keep uh, how to keep uh, our our temperature uh, rise below the two degrees. Also, we do have the uh, EU Green Deal, but also alternative fuel uh, infrastructure directive, the clean vehicle directive. I will present you in the next slide. But also, we do have national policies. Uh, I wanted to mention here the example of the Netherlands. Which has committed already to uh, the transition to 100% zero emission buses until 2025. 
um, this uh, means, for instance, that in the procurement, in the concession contracts that are launched by the different uh, regional authorities, the transport authorities, only um, only zero emission buses are uh, are accepted. This is a requirement in the, in the concessions. No, um, this uh, this definitely means that when we uh, push for zero emission and low emission, no, which is the purpose of the clean vehicle directive. We can we can introduce uh, this uh, this uh, we can bring these benefits closer to the citizens and at the same time you promote and strength innovation and competitiveness of the industry. And I think it's very interesting to see how in many in many of the examples we saw also in in Seoul and and in China we have seen that uh, the existence of the local industry manufacturing at the local level uh, buses is bringing this sector now is bringing the introduction of this technology um, at, a, at a better at a better pace. Um, again, for this reason, for me, rather than a challenge, uh, clean technologies and this legislation pushing for the introduction of clean technologies is definitely a, an opportunity uh, the bus sector is, uh, is, is sizing. Uh, first, to rethink, to redesign the system, to optimize perhaps your bus network uh, to uh, upgrade specific parts of, uh, of your operation, etc. So what we have seen is that at this level, and having also seen that we face the, the still end pandemic, post pandemic period, we have seen that many cities, they do have the political will, but might lack of the capabilities no, and the know-how. And um, also that even if uh, the, a, a clear setting, a, a clear um, target setting is, is necessary, uh, even when you have your uh, immobility strategy, you need you know, some support to, to bring it forward. Let me give you just a brief look what is the uh, Clean Vehicle Directive. This is, um, this is so for me the main, the main uh, regulation in Europe right now uh, driving the transition to, to low emission and zero emission uh, bus fleets. So what we see here is that we have um, uh, mandatory quotas for public procurement. This means that as, um, as, uh, as from the uh, inter, uh, entering into force of this, um, of this directive, which was August this year, and until the end of 2025, we have different quotas for newly procured bus. This means that each uh, newly uh, procured bus needs to comply with these targets. We have a first period of five years for this until the end of 2025. And uh, from 2026 to the end of 2030, we have the different quotas. You can see the first uh, period uh, is, is set in a target of 45% of clean uh, emission uh, you, sorry, clean technologies, and uh, the half of it, 22.5%, should be zero emission technologies. Now the question is, uh, what is clean? What is clean and what is zero emission? So I I um, I can show you this in the left uh, on the left side of the slide. A clean bus is fueled by electricity, hydrogen, also natural gas, both compressed natural and liquefied natural gas. Also, most uh, biofuels but also uh, synthetic and paraffinic, uh, paraffinic fuels and LPG. And very important, zero emission at the tailpipe. Bus is a vehicle either without an internal combustion engine or with an internal combustion engine, but emitting less than one gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour or kilometer. This said, uh, these targets are, uh, are set for uh, the, the European uh, Union member states, you can see on the right side. Uh, lower targets apply for uh, for the rest of the uh, of the member states. These targets were also set and, and calculated based on uh, on different parameters like uh, population density, GDP, uh, etc. So this uh, this policy framework this is in the frame of the European Commission Clean Bus Deployment Initiative. This initiative uh, is setting, uh, as I say here, not the right policy uh, framework for kicking uh, and, and boosting the introduction of clean technologies in Europe. It's, um, 
it's already a long uh, way with uh, with the uh, with the development and the uh, and the launch of of this uh, of this initiative uh, in 2017, and um, it's it has three elements. I will present you in the next slide. But basically, what what the Commission saw and uh, what we as UATP definitely also understand is that there is three elements for the scale up of uh, of, elect, uh, of electric buses in the case of this uh, of this training today, but in general, a clean buses. No. We need uh, we need a right, the right policy framework, which is already in place through the directive and other other directives that apply. But basically, this is the one uh, which is really kicking and pushing for for a concrete number of uh, in, uh, clean buses introduced in, in the fleets. We need the financial funding uh, funding framework, and also we need the exchange of best practice and knowledge. And this part is exactly what uh, what is uh, tackled you know, by by the project I will present you in the next slides, which is called the Clean Bus Europe Platform. With the Clean Bus Europe Platform, what the uh, what the European Commission has done is to create the tool. This is a strategic line of, of action, which is supporting the implementation of the Clean Vehicle Directive, meaning helping operators and authority cities to comply with the set, with the target sets by the uh, by the directive, and at the same time boosting from uh, a wider perspective what is uh, clean uh, bus deployment in member states. These three pillars I mentioned before is, is first of all, a, a declaration you know, endorsing uh, the common ambition of uh, not just the industry, but of course the main actors, the cities, to accelerate this rollout of clean buses, creating a deployment platform. This is the project I mentioned, the clean bus platform, which is, of course, the place to be you know, for, for the public authorities, the transport operators, the whole industry uh, chain plus financial and funding uh, organization in order to exchange information, in order to uh, support each other, uh, matching supply and demand in the case of the industry and the funding and financing uh, organizations, and of course, you no know, being able to uh, create in this sense, the uh, the necessary uh, investment and leverage uh, the investment in this sense. No. Additionally, it also uh, foresees the creation of an expert group, which will be monitoring and following up this uh, this development. And that's the project. So, what it's uh, put in in a sentence, what uh, the Clean Bus Europe platform is doing is really accelerating the introduction and creating you know, the the the, the the large speed upscale uh, that we need uh, in Europe worldwide, definitely, but focusing in Europe uh, today. So, uh, as I said before, electrification needs of the cooperation of uh, all involved partners. And this is, uh, this is the, one of the main goals of the platform, bringing together these, uh, these players uh, to exchange knowledge and expertise. Also, the project provides technical support Meaning, if a uh, city and operator uh, needs uh, to deploy uh, still uh, an e-mobility strategy, the project foresees technical support through a local uh, expert network for this. But at the same time, when it comes to the tendering phase, to do the, does, the, does the city or the transport authority need support to to develop some specifications to define the specifications? There is also a local. Um, experts uh, already ready for that. Uh, and as I said before, to, uh, uh, to match the supply and demand, meaning through the uh, through, uh, dialogue sessions, marketplaces, not with, uh, with uh, funding and financing institutions, but also with, uh, with the industry, what, uh, what is available on the market when I want to purchase an electric bus, there are many manufacturers. So what can I, what can I uh, get? Uh, in the market, the same for, for the funding and financing. No? Technologies uh, that are focused uh, in the project is uh, battery electric, plug-in hybrid, natural gas, but also hydrogen, uh, fuel cell hydrogen, and IMC trolley buses, in motion charging battery trolley buses. These technologies refer, of course, to the technologies we saw before uh, in, the, in the clean vehicle directly. Uh, briefly, main pillars we have in the project. The first, of course, capacity building and knowledge transfer to the different activities I will show you 
in the next slide, technical support and facilitation. We also have a look to the social dialogue on the impacts on the work part, meaning what happens when we introduce uh, clean technologies. Uh, we talked before about depot upgrades. We also know that we need to train uh, our staff, uh, maintenance staff, for instance, in safety uh, regulations, how to handle well with this uh, with these new uh, with these new uh, buses. Plus, for instance, uh, also trainings for drivers how to make the best of the battery. We saw some uh, interesting numbers shared by by our colleague before uh, with this uh, about the Shenzhen um, energy consumption no buses. So uh, basically. There is um, there is a need also to understand how to make these transitions for the staff uh, uh, sustainable and acceptable. And of course, we also monitor what is the deployment, not just along the project, but um, in the European market. These are the activities that we cover in the project for uh, capacity building and all its exchange. Of course, not basic is uh, classic is the webinars. We also organize study tours, uh, meaning study tours to experience cities to so have seen um, in the in the map before uh, also the marketplaces as I mentioned the technical support we create also a lot of different uh, project uh, outputs uh, in the coming from uh, from the different workshops from the webinars from the technical visits etc and all this will be available uh, in the clean bus toolkit section of the website that you can uh, you can see here. Interesting, I think, for anyone interested in uh, in e bus deployment, not only clean bus deployment in Europe, is to have a look to to this section specifically because first we do have a uh, market monitoring going on. This means we are following and uh, and showing data about the tenders, orders, and buses in service. This we do in cooperation with uh, different organizations like Sustainable Bus Magazine and also the library section, which will uh, provide you different material, different material when, uh, yeah, when it comes to eBus deployment, for instance, interactive tools for planning or webinars run in the project, but also um, interesting webinars we have been uh, a part of, etc. As I said before, uh, the results of the study visits, etc will be also there and i think that's everything from my side thank you very much thanks from my side uh, to all the speakers for their super exciting inputs i think we have learned a lot um Ida, i might start with a question to you uh, a question that was posed while you were speaking so i feel it might uh, it might have targeted um your insights but if any of the other speakers might also want to add they are surely welcome to do so. So the question is by Gaurab Raj Pandey, and um, he's asking what policies are there to reduce or eliminate uh, carbon, uh, the, the carbon emissions and pollutants uh, during manufacturing of electric vehicles, referring to buses and cars, and also uh, charging stations. Yeah. Of course, this, this question refers to yeah to the life cycle analysis no of the uh, of the manufacturing of buses and and the infrastructure we need for them. I can tell you right now from the top of my head which uh, which are these regulations, uh, but uh, I can I can tell you that within the UATP bus committee, you might know we have different committees uh, inside the organization. We are looking uh, at this uh, at this topic, and we will be able to produce some uh, yeah some fact sheets on on our results. There is a very interesting uh, project run and led by Scandinavian uh, public transport authorities, and they have looked very closely to this uh, to this aspect. There is not uh, th that's not a regulation. It was uh, let's say uh, an initiative. Uh, and based on the will of these Scandinavian um, cities to look at this, uh, at least at this point. Basically, because um, very often they got these questions from, from the public, from the passengers, from the citizens. And uh, building on that, they, they started this initiative. Um, in any case, what I can do is definitely have a look also with my colleagues if, um, at the European department. Uh, and uh, if there is a specific regulation, I can share it afterwards with you. Sorry for not being able right now to to mention any 
any myself, uh, but it's also not specifically um, the focus uh, of, of of my of my work at the bus unit. Yeah, thanks, Ida. And I think it would be great if if you could follow up. Maybe some colleagues might have a rush sure. that might be useful for for this audience. And um, I, I think I mean the point is very well taken. It's about looking at the the life cycle of um, electric mobility and uh, that question in that sense is, is highly relevant um, to look at. Um, I might continue with a question to Siddharth. I hope he's still with us. Um, there's been a question by Justin Chan um, referring to the cost of the charging infrastructure. So the question has been for a huge number of electric vehicles in India a lot of the charging infrastructure will be needed. And he's referring to, to the aspect of, uh, you know, this costing a lot and, and how this would be covered. Siddharth, are you still with us? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm, I'm still with you. Perfect. Uh, yeah, no, this is, this is a very interesting question. Uh, you know, for this huge number of EVs, whether the cost of charging infrastructure will be very high or not. Of course, this charge this cost would be very high and that is why the government has actually come in and they've actually subsidized uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, a certain number of uh, charging stations already so i mean on the cost side we're looking at a higher side but the interesting thing is that what india is also trying to do is that we are moving away from a system of uh, you know aggregated charging stations to disaggregated charging solutions so now given the fact that the e2 electric two wheelers are you know, the most popular right now, what we are really encouraging is the indigenous development of localized charging solutions, which can be installed outside your homes, outside your electricity poles and so on and so forth, uh, rather than, you know, huge aggregated charging stations, which are of course funded for, but the government at least has already subsidized the installation of about 4,000 electric charges. And this is just the central government, but the state governments are also, uh, you know, the state governments are also trying to provide, uh, you know, provide uh, funds for this. And uh, what is also happening now is that uh, just to add to this, uh, you know, add to this question is that with such a huge number of charging infrastructure also comes into question of the electricity grid reliability. And that is something that we are also working on, uh, you know, very actively to ensure that, you know, uh, these electric charges are well synchronized, not just with the grid, but also with our uh, renewable energy targets. So surely it's expensive, but I think the need is to move from disaggregated, uh, you know, aggregated solutions to disaggregated kind of charging solutions. And that's what we are witnessing. In India. Thank you so much, Siddharth. Um, I think I'd be continuing with a question to Bart. And uh, Bart, you made a, a brief reference um, during your presentation back uh, to the question on, on you know, the, the ASEAN perspective. And I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit more on uh, your ideas of how you know, this, in a way, FAME approach could be taken up on a more regional scale. I, I know you had referred um, to the local manufacturing and the interest by many countries um, to, to accelerate local manufacturing. I just wanted to ask you once more to elaborate uh, your views um, on that. Thanks, Steffi. In terms of uh, providing uh, incentives, I think maybe what I wanted to say was at the ASEAN level, there is definitely room for cooperation uh, between the ASEAN member states, and they are doing this on many fronts. For example, the ASEAN Fuel Economy Roadmap, which has been adopted at the regional level, which aims to promote better vehicles. All, all, all initially focusing on light duty vehicles or cars. But for the case of electric vehicles, I believe they will also be able to do this, including two and three wheelers. But it will be more of uh, regulations and guidelines uh, at the regional level. When it comes to providing uh, incentives and subsidies, it will all come down to national level uh, support. Uh, definitely would be good for the ASEAN member states to not copy, but or learn from uh, the experience in India. And in a way, many countries are doing this now, particularly, I think I mentioned Thailand. They have specific production and manufacturing targets for two and three wheelers, cars and buses. Uh, they are giving a lot of incentives for to stimulate local production, so joint ventures, not only just uh, receiving the exports from other countries. 
Malaysia also has this, and Indonesia. The Philippines, uh, yeah, they still don't have this kind of uh, comprehensive uh, policy. Uh, I think this will be a challenge for many countries in the region as we move forward. Everybody wants to do manufacturing, but uh, to some extent, and we must accept that some, some countries will be due to the size of the country, the size of the market, they will not be able to make it. Uh, and maybe this is where they will just have to balance uh, importing electric vehicles and uh, using this or maybe other maybe for batteries or uh, other uh, sectors of electric mobility, but definitely not all countries. Thank you. Thanks, Bart. I think that's uh, good insights and, and also kind of, you know, looking at this, the specialities of each of the country context and seeing what's possible and why the integration might make sense and can take place. Um, I would like to continue with a question to Mr. Lee. Um, Mr. Lee, are you still with us? I think he is not here. He's not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, then we might not be able to ask him this question, but um, I, I could still ask the question and then if if any other um, partners, any other speakers would feel comfortable to answer it, I think that would also be nice. Um, Mr. Lee in his presentation had referred to eco-friendly low-speed uh, vehicle roads um, that they had implemented in Seoul. And the question that um, I wanted to ask was around uh, the public perception um, of let's say the local residents um, that are living uh, in the neighborhoods and how those residents were engaged in the process. And I'm just wondering if any of the other speakers has experience on that and could shed some light on how um, this has been uh, successfully implemented and, and how the engagement, let's say, with the neighborhoods uh, have taken place. I'm wondering if maybe um, Ms. Ms. Lu from ITDP might have insights from China. Yeah. Um, hi. Yeah, I think um, so. So your question is um, is sorry. Could you just repeat the question, please? The question was around eco-friendly low-speed vehicle roads, um, which they have implemented in Seoul. But I know they have also, you know, implemented a similar project in many other um, Asian cities. Uh, so in a way, low emission zones. And I'm just wondering how. You know, I just wanted to emphasize the importance of, of engaging the public and the neighborhoods um, and residents associations. And I was wondering, you know, if someone could share some some insights on the public perception of those initiatives and how the public has been successfully engaged. Um, I think in, in China, in the low emission zone, actually, IDDP has a project in um, in Jinan city, which is a, um, a city located also in the central of China. And in the low emission zone, we largely promoted the cycling and the walking infrastructure and, and also improving the satisfaction of the public transport and electrifying the total bus fleet. Um, however, we, uh, we don't have the um, incentive to, to reducing uh, the speed of the buses. And, um, but, uh, but you know, for the electric buses, uh, because you know, the noise is very slow and also uh, you don't have the very, um, you don't have the smile of the petrol. Um, and so it's, uh, uh, so it's very uh, good for the passengers. And so the, uh, also the passengers and the neighborhoods are uh, also very happy to uh, to have the electric buses on road. Um, so, um, yes, I, I think am I uh, am I answering this question because I I don't think we have such uh, such uh, practices in China right now. I think you answered it nicely by sharing a little bit on, on in a way, the, the perception 
you know, of people that live in those zones where the e-buses, for example, are passing by and the fact that, I mean, those e-buses bring a lot of benefits on, on the issues of, of local air pollution and so on. I had a follow-up question for you, um, Ms. Lu, on, on the note of equality. You had mentioned in your presentation that um, there's been a national level targets um, on air quality. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you could highlight and elaborate a little bit more on, on the need for such data um, to feed into to setting, you know, targets. So, so the need for, for local air quality data that can really justify why certain policies and immobility strategies need to be put in place. If you could uh, provide your insights on that, that would be super. Yeah, yeah, sure. For, um, you know, you, uh, recently the, the Chinese national governments have uh, has a uh, very ambitious goal of achieving carbon neutral in 2013 and uh, in 2030. So, um, and also the transport plays a very important role in terms of the um, pollution emissions. Uh, so it's uh, necessary to electrify in the, uh, the, in, in, the in the transport sector. And also it's the public, pa in the public transport sector is um, uh, it's also it's actually very it's easier to electrify the compared with the private vehicles you know and um, and I also and also the and the national tar target of the uh, the emission targets is also consisted uh, by a very comprehensive framework uh, not only include the, the, the transport sector but also you know the energy, um, the energy sector, and um, and and in the uh, in the public transport sector, the the major uh, the the major um, instrument that is used by the national government is the financial support, not only for the uh, the purchasing of the electric vehicles, but also for the later operation, uh, operation and also the supporting infrastructures, and um, um, and also the national government has a series of uh, instruments to encourage the uh, rapid development of the and uh, the manufacturers and the electric vehicles industry. So this also plays a very important role. Um, to accelerating the electrification process in China nationwide. And um, I think I also want to uh, mention that uh, the Chinese government uh, has the uh, has the incentive policies that are different uh, that are differ different in different regions because uh, you know the emissions and the air pollution and um, is um, it's very uh, it's different in different uh, in regions in China. Some regions have uh, because of the um, inherent uh, environmental uh, inherent environmental cohort, uh, background, so it's easier for them to and to electrifying the vehicle split. Uh, but in other regions, um, um, uh, some factors may largely affect the um, and the adoption of the electrification goals. So the Chinese government released different region, different policies for the different regions, and also set different um, uh, emission goals for different regions. So so this. Um, this policy really drives the faster adaptation of the uh, electrification goals. Thank, thank you so much. I think you provided some, some good highlights on the importance of uh, data to actually make those policies a reality. So I think that's, that's a very interesting uh, view on that. Um, there has been one question by Sahara Brahim, who has been asking about um, the importance of multiple stakeholders uh, working together as part of e-mobility policies and projects. 
And maybe I can address uh, this question to, to Siddharth, um, because I think the India example has really been uh, insightful in terms of uh, how many different levels of government and how many different other stakeholders are involved. So the question to you, Siddharth, what has been your experience in terms of managing or addressing different perspectives and diverse interests and values in multi-stakeholder engagement? Uh, I think I think that's a very important question because India, as I said earlier, we have over 750 different um, you know levels of government which are decentralized. So it's it's really um, you know uh, it, it's really more of a challenge to work with multiple stakeholders. But I think the key has been uh, you really have to incentivize you really have to incentivize them in some manner or the other to actually come on the table. For instance, we did not, while we've pushed, uh, you know, different stakeholders of the states to actually focus on their own EV policies, we at least gave them a national framework as part of which, you know, we provided them with various incentives uh, so that they're able to come on board. Second, what we've also done very recently, and that's uh, as part of our engagement with, uh, you know, the NDC TIA project, so there we are working with a consortium of uh, you know seven different partners, including World Resources Institute, uh, you know International Transport Forum, Slow Cat, Train Twenty One, and so on. Uh, GIZ, of course. What we've actually done is that we have created something called the National uh, Stakeholder Platform for Decarbonizing Transport. So we've institutionalized the platform, which not only consists of representatives of the central, local, and urban level governments but also private sector players, industry associations, original equipment manufacturers. So every single person is, is now on the same table as part of an institutional platform. So now it has become much more easier for us to take, um, you know, to take this sort of feedback from them. For instance, if, if you recall, there was one slide where I showed, which said that, you know, we have uh, a four wheeler subsidy available for about 50,000 vehicles, but only, you know, 1,500 have availed it. But when we sat down with the you know equipment manufacturers, the, manuf the manufacturers actually said, "Look, our vehicles are in the premium segment. We don't want them to be used in ride-sharing, um, you know, arrangements. So, and right now you've made the scheme applicable only to ride-sharing arrangements. So now, hopefully, in the next version of the, you know, the next time the policy is revised, we will include them as well, right? So, I mean, that's the advantage. So, I think it's very important for, uh, you know, for all, uh, you know, for all governments or all countries to actually create a kind of a uh, to create a kind of a platform where regular interactions are held, not just to take feedback and their opinions, but also to try and address, uh, you know, any problems that they might have. And of course, you know, with one policy, not everybody can be happy. But the, the thing here is that we should never think of policies as something that's, you know, kind of etched in stone and it cannot be revised. I think it should be periodically revised, even on a monthly basis, uh, you know, so as to incorporate the feedback. So, I mean, it's been challenging, but so far we're, we are doing good because we have everybody on, on the same page. That's good to hear. And I think congratulations for that. It seems, it seems like your initiatives are a good example for the multi-stakeholder collaborations. Um, I'll be continuing with a question to Aida, which has come from Heranisti. Um, and um, it is being asked, what kind of social dialogue do you think um, could be done with the workforce so they do not only become the practitioner and get the impact of autom automation and digitalization uh, policy, but also get a fair transition to fight for the better climate. So in a way, I think the question relates to how do we get the workforce um, into the same mindset and, and maybe what has UITP done on that front? Yeah. Yeah, no, that definitely. That's uh, not just part of this of this project because uh, we have also already results uh, on social dialogue, uh, but for the purpose indeed of digitalization and automation. Uh, I can share the link uh, with the with the audience uh, afterwards on this. Um, but definitely part of the uh, of of the of the work when you introduce uh, any new technology. Now we talk about clean technologies, battery electric, of course, because that's uh, yeah that's what we need now to fight uh, to fight the the challenges we we mentioned before, climate change and local pollution, basically. No, but indeed getting getting on board or or, or being able to gain on board in this uh, in this uh, exercise, the staff is crucial. 
it is not just from the point of view of getting them engaged with a new technology in terms of operational skills, meaning, okay, they need to learn a new, new, uh, new ways of going, uh, of going around and, and uh, handling these, uh, these vehicles, but also to be um, enthusiastic and be even, I would say, as ambassadors no? of, of the efforts of the operator of the city uh, towards this uh, improvement. Uh, because indeed it brings it brings uh, benefits to the whole society, to the whole city. We are not talking just about uh, an improvement at the operational level when you have reached no, your optimization and you have learned uh, already, you have passed about the learning curve. No, um, this is this is something that uh, that is uh, it's very is very relevant. And we have, for instance, in this uh, in this project in the Clean Bus we were platform. We work with uh, representative, uh, representatives of the tra of some trade unions in the countries that are part of the platform, and um, I want to share with you one of the uh, of the views of uh, the representative of uh, the UK trade union. Uh, he always talks. He's a bus driver for over thirty years, and he always talks about this specific aspect. It's not just a technology which can be fun to work with once you have learned how to do that. It's exactly these concerns about how can I uh, bring much value, not just to my company, but to the society, to the city I live in. Um, we are going to run interviews with, uh, with these uh, representatives of the trade unions, with uh, also the labor representatives in these, uh, in these cities to learn specifically what are the main needs and what are the wishes and how can we uh, no, fulfill them, uh, approach them from the labor side as well. But um, it's it's quite of a nice environment, this project, especially for social dialogue, because it's it's a common understanding on both sides, the labor and the unions, that uh, this is something new and we can uh, write the way uh, together how to how to define, no, how to go with uh, with potential impacts. Though I have to say there is no bus driver I have talked to uh, who is not extremely happy with uh, with uh, in, in battery buses, no, in this case, and who is not enjoying uh, not just driving them, but even the long hours, no, because they, they have long hours. There is, of course, no fumes, vibrations are much less, the noise is less. So it's quite of, a, of an improvement for the local, uh, for the work conditions of the, uh, of the, of the staff, in this case, for the driver. But also, um, there is many projects we have been part to where they, uh, where we have run a service among uh, passengers about passenger satisfaction. So staff one side, very positive results so far. More to come within this project. Plus the uh, the the view of the passengers always uh, is always very positive. One, I think the the key here is perhaps how to make that everyone feels part of this transition. It is not just saying, okay, I will, yeah, as I said before, no, this is an opportunity to gain the trust back of our passengers. And not only that, also to make that this is owned by everyone no, in the, uh, in the ecosystem. The end user is the key, but until we reach the end user, we do have a lot of steps in between. And that's part of, uh, that's, that's part of this, uh, this project. Thank you so much, Aiden. It's great to hear that, uh... I mean, UITP is in close contact uh, with the customers and the workforce, so it's it's good to hear from the perspectives from that angle um, as well. Um, looking at the time, I'm fearing that we have come towards the end of the session. Um, uh, I would maybe like to briefly summarize uh, the main points that stood out uh, for me and um, yeah, and and then conclude uh, with those few remarks. Um, I think four, four issues um, I, I would like to highlight here. One of them, I think, is the need for, for vertical coordination. Um, we have heard from, from the efforts from, from, the, from the European side on the Clean Vehicle Directive, which I think really, um, in a way, was a, was a regional um, directive and policy document that, that fostered um, electric mobility uh, across the European countries, but then also vertical um, coordination in within the countries. I think uh, Siddharth um, very nicely presented um, 
the India example, where we could see how the how the national policies, in a way, accelerated the uptake um, on the city level as well. So vertical uh, coordination uh, maybe was was the first issue that really stood out to me. Secondly, and I think we just also had, had a question, and that was was really this this highlighting the the multi stakeholder approach and the need for that. Um, I'm, I'm recalling the presentation by ITDP from, from China and how, for example, the, the Shenzhen experience um, illustrated, um, for example, the innovative business models um, of, of the bus operators and, and showed how the bus operators are working together with the governments in a way that they, they don't have to worry about the capital costs. And I think those kind of uh, stakeholder, multi-stakeholder collaborations are very much needed to make immobility a success um, in reality. The third point that I wanted to highlight is the need for locally appropriate solutions. I think that very much came out from, from the, the experience from South Korea and kind of highlighting the, the need for very diverse um, immobility solutions that tackle the, the different um, demands for, for mobility in, in the cities. And I think it also was highlighted very much by Bert uh, from UNEP, um, where he illustrated um, the different um, the different uh, two and three wheeler solutions from the different um, Asian countries, and and how each country kind of has their own uh, features and and unique opportunities that they are embarking on. The fourth point um, that I wanted to take up from what what Ida was saying was on on COVID nineteen and uh, utilizing uh, COVID which is, is really a time to reflect and to rethink. Um, I mentioned that it's now time to, to also build back trust in, in public transport and, and really reflect on how do we move forward with more sustainable and lower emission pathways as compared to the business um, as usual before the pandemic. And I think that's also an important point when we look at uh, green recoveries in the countries and in the cities um, to make sure that we are doing better than, than what we have done before. With those for your few remarks, I would like to um, thank Carolina for, for co-moderating the session. I would like to very much uh, thank all the speakers, uh, the audience, um, and also the host from Clean Air Asia. I think it's been a very insightful discussion today. I have very much enjoyed and learned a lot, um, take a lot of insights away. Um, that will be useful for our work at UN Habitat as well. Um, and lastly, I wanted to highlight uh, that tomorrow there is the day three of the training event uh, for the solutions um, plus regional training for Africa, uh, uh, sorry, for Asia. And um, it'll be on uh, charging infrastructure, its characteristics, planning, policy, and operations. I think it'll be taking place um, at the same time. So please feel free to log in. And here are further exciting uh, presentations now focused on the charging infrastructure from the Asian perspective. And we look forward to have you in the training session tomorrow as well. With that, um, I would also like to say bye-bye and hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>